please all rise. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the city of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask you that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. Amen. We acknowledge this country and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as traditional custodians, their language, songs and dance. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. May we continue to peacefully walk together in respect and in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Wong will be absent today and I move that he be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillor Huang be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,677th meeting held on Tuesday the 3rd of May 2022 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Hutton and seconded by Councillor Landers that the minutes of the 4,676th meeting of Council held on the 3rd of May 2022 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, we have a public participant here with us today. I'd like to call on Mr Tenzing Doring, who will address the Chamber on Tibetan culture and life in Brisbane. Mr Doring, the orderly is showing you to your seat. Thank you, Mr Doring. You can stand or sit, depending on your preference, and your five minutes starts when the microphone is turned on. Thank you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chairman, Lord Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Tenzin Pinzot Doring. I was born in the capital city of Tibet called Lhasa. Unfortunately, I didn't have the fortune of living there in the last 27 years. Um, it is really a great honour uh, to be present and speaking in this great hall of Brisbane City Council. It feels even greater as a Tibetan refugee to have this opportunity of speaking to the people's representative of the city. Having born in Tibet, but brought up most of the time in India, and then finally settled in Australia since 2018, I have a great pride being a resident of this city. I fled Tibet when I was just four years old, uh, nine years old, uh, having separated from mother, and uh, had my father succumb to injuries inflicted from the Chinese Communist Party government when he participated in the political activism which made me um, stay away from them in the last 27 years. However, Brisbane City and Australia made me feel like a home here, which we call a home away from home. And thank you so much for that. When I left Tibet and later India, and having come here, I still meet a lot of people from India and people from China, and it feels really great and amazing it indicates how small the world is, how connected we are, and how inter-Tibetan we are to each other. As a Tibetan Buddhist follower, this is truly accepted not only in theory, but also in real terms, which I have experienced in this great city. However, most of the Tibetans who have arrived in this country since 1997, most of them, were either former political prisoners, or the children related to them, like me. We have had 2,500 Tibetans estimate in Australia. All of them have come under the Global Humanitarian Scheme, visa, and many of them live in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. And this year, we had a lot of Tibetans coming to Brisbane, and most of them have chosen Brisbane as their city, as their resident, as their home. And this shows how this city is welcoming the Tibetans. I must have arrived in 2018, and it's my like almost three and a half years old since I arrived. Tibetans um, continue to arrive in this city, and 
we have a community called Tibetan Community of Queensland. We managed to preserve our culture, our language through different activities. And some of our counselors in this house are evidence and witness to that in the past. We celebrate His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama every year. We celebrate Tibetan New Year. Some of them have been a guest to us. We also have a Tibetan weekend school because we are very, very uh, strong and feel deeply about our language, uh, which we have a problem in Tibet. Therefore, we try to preserve it as much as we can wherever we are, whether we are in Australia, whether we are in North America, whether we are in Europe, or whether we are in India. That's so closely to us. Therefore, we have every Saturday a Tibetan language school. And uh, we are very really thankful for Brisbane City Councillors for helping us and um, facilitating us every opportunity that we can avail of. Finally, before I finish, I would like to thank John Odishri, Councillor for Gabba, Vicky Howard, Brisbane Centre Councillor. We have been in connect with each other in the last three years. And I'm sure that as more Tibetans come, they will be living in other suburbs and other wards, and we will still get more connections to other councillors, and you will definitely feel the, the, the culture of us, and we will have the opportunity to seek help from you, and this is how we happily uh, live in this great city. Finally, before I wrap up, I wish on behalf of the six Tibetans around the world, 2,500 Tibetans in Australia, and of course over 156 Tibetans in this city and Queensland. May I wish all the councillors, including the chairman, Lord Mayor, all the best in your endeavour to make this great, this city a great for your own people, and may this city shine under the sunshine state of Queensland. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Please take a seat. Councillor Howard, are you responding? Thank you. Councillor Howard is responding to you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and it gives me a great deal of delight to uh, respond to Tenzin because, uh, as he says, uh, we have known each other for a long time now, and uh, I know that uh, both Councillor Shri and I were in attendance at the very, the most recent um, Tibetan New Year, and we really um, appreciate uh, being a part of those wonderful celebrations, and uh, everyone always makes us feel so, so welcome. So, uh, really, if you can take back our thanks to the community for their welcoming of us. And uh, can I say that it is always great to uh, have speakers such as yourself address council because it gives all of us then the opportunity uh, to hear and, and to, to understand uh, some of the issues that the community faces, uh, but also to know about the positive impact that that engagement with the Tibetan community has had on the city of Brisbane. Um, in particular, I was pleased that we had um, Tibetan music feature in our recent Briz Asia festival and of course it, uh, it's, it's always uh, beautiful and uh, so it made such a difference uh, to that particular festival. And I know that uh, we have supported with advice on grants and sponsorship programs and uh, uh, you know certainly the potential for the Tibetan Language School and we know how important that is for the young people to retain their language. Um, and, I, and I know that we've had events in New Farm Park and to see the children and to, um, to just uh, share with you the wonderful spirit that is so inclusive of all of us is really something special. So um, we are an inclusive city and Brisbane prides itself on welcoming new residents. Um, but we can't do it without the leadership of people like yourself and, uh, and people who are welcoming their the Tibetans to our community. It's wonderful to have that link and for you to be able to connect them with, with others. So thank you for your presentation and uh, to all that you do for the Tibetan community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Dory. Billy will show you out. Thank you. Councillors, we move on to the next item, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Civic Cabinet Chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, immediately following the recent floods, you announced that former Governor of Queensland Paul de Jersey would be tasked with conducting a review of the 2022 floods. With the uh, review now complete, could you please update the Chamber on Mr de Jersey's findings? Thank you. Lord Mayor. <clears throat> 
Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Mackay uh, uh, for that question. And I know that um, as uh, one of the uh, many flood affected councillors with flood affected wards, um, this is something that you are very interested in, as are all of us in this chamber. Uh, it is true that um, today we were presented with the uh, final report uh, into the, uh, well, the review of Council's flood response uh, by former Governor John uh, <laughs> Paul de Jersey. And uh, that report um, has included in it uh, 37 recommendations across a range of different topics. Uh, but before I go into those, I just did want to say that uh, it in many ways seems um, less than 10 weeks ago that we had the flood. In many, weeks, in many ways, it seems longer than 10 weeks ago. Um, it's interesting how time uh, plays tricks on you when it, when it comes to situations like this. Uh, and 10 weeks ago, we saw 177 suburbs impacted by flood across Brisbane, uh, more than 20,000 households. Uh, we saw the biggest flood cleanup ever conducted in the city's history uh, being carried out. Uh, but now, just 72 days after that event, uh, we now have a blueprint going forward to help ensure that uh, we are guided appropriately and independently in the decisions that we make in response to 2022 floods. Uh, the other thing though, that was uh, reviewed as part of this was our response to the 2011 floods. Now, we had independent reviews into uh, 2011 floods, and the first question we asked was, did we respond appropriately to those 2011 reviews? And then secondly, how do we respond to 2022? And thirdly, what can we learn uh, from both of these events? But in particular, what can we learn from 2022? Uh, I made it clear right from the beginning that we must learn the lessons of 2022. Uh, and that's what this document uh, is all about and will help us to do. I can confirm that all 37 recommendations uh, we will accept and we will action. All 37, uh, lock, stock and barrel to make sure that we get on with them. Uh, one in particular that uh, is a very high priority is sorting out uh, the problems with the early alert system. Um, and as you know, the early alert system is federally funded. It's operated by state agencies and it took far too long to get messages out to the people of Brisbane. Uh, we have two systems in play. Uh, one is the council control weather zone system, which is a voluntary sign up system. Uh, and the other is the early alert system, which goes to every single person with a phone. And so this is a system that whether you've signed up or not, you get a message. Uh, and that early alert system was taking far too long. We have 1.2 million residents in Brisbane and anyone with a phone had to get a message. And some of those messages were, receiving hour, were being received hours and hours later after we had asked for them to be sent. This needs to be addressed before the next storm season. So uh, one of the top priorities we'll be doing is working to make sure we can get that system working smoothly. But secondly, I think, uh, and one of the recommendations also is that we need to work out ways to get more si people on our voluntary system as well. Uh, currently, uh, from memory, there's around 200,000 sign-ups to our voluntary weather zone system. But as I said before, we have a population of over a million people here. We need more people in that voluntary system. Uh, I'd be keen to look at what kind of incentives can be offered to get people on, uh, but certainly we need to boost that weather zone system as well. Uh, across the uh, 37 recommendations, there's a whole range of diverse things. Uh, Councillor Adaman, you'll be uh, interested to know. Number one relates to the Pullenvale Ward. Number two relates to Tennyson Ward. Uh, but uh, these... Uh, Thank you, Mr Chair. These um, recommendations are all based on uh, the uh, independent assessment of what happened, but also based on the submissions of councillors, which are no doubt informed by their communities and community feedback. Uh, that is indeed our job. Uh, and going forward, uh, we will getting, uh, be getting on with implementing every single one of these 37 recommendations. So, uh, Mr Chair, I'd like to table uh, this report. The report should be now live on Council's website for anyone to see, both councillors and members of the public. Uh, and so please do take the time uh, to read through that report, to understand it, uh, and I look forward to getting on with the important job of implementing all 37 recommendations. Thank, Thank you, Mr you Chair. Further questions?
Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in your budget documents, you set aside $200 million for the purchase of Olympic sites and claim to be negotiating with the Vizzy Glass Factory with the intention of purchasing that site for the Brisbane 2032 International Media Centre. Now, in typical fashion, you jump the gun to get publicity without properly considering the impact that decision would have on hundreds of manufacturing jobs. You then completely botched that negotiation and, as a result, the Palaszczuk government took the lead and bought that site outright. Now, Continue, please, Councillor Kirsten. Thanks, Chair. Now, luckily for manufacturing workers, the Labor State government actually cared about them. You now have $200 million spare sitting in the budget, which has already been accounted for through rates increases. So, Lord Mayor, now that the state government has purchased this site, how will you be spending that $200 million? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> well, well, well. <laughs> He's always late to the party, and, and today uh, we see once again um, days and days go by, um, and uh, he tries to put a uh, Labor Party political spin on everything. But can't help himself. Uh, I can tell you the um, the Brisbane City Council and the state government continue to work cooperatively together um, to make sure we deliver what is necessary for uh, the 2032 Olympics. Uh, and I made it clear that what I want to see out of 2032, one of the big legacies, is the creation of South Bank 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, look, I will accept Councillor Cassidy's congratulations later for getting one of the critical things that we need to see out of the Olympics paid for by the state government. Mm -hmm. um, because that is a rare thing when the state government pays for something uh, instead of council. Usually it's the other way around. Usually it is the other way around. Usually. Yeah, they withdraw from things they should be doing, like public transport, like housing, and they get other people to do it. But we have successfully uh, engineered a situation where the state government has paid for something they absolutely should pay for. Um, and so I am excited to see, uh, after the Games, the creation of South Bank 2.0, and we will be working very, very closely to make sure that is a good community outcome. Uh, but uh, Councillor Cassidy, um, has demonstrated his um, serious misunderstanding or lack of understanding about uh, how the council budget works and what that $200 million was that was referred to. Every cent of that $200 million would have been borrowings, borrowings, not sitting in an account somewhere, against an asset. I, basic economics here, now I know Cassidy, Councillor Cassidy doesn't understand this, but uh, if you get an asset and you've got borrowings against it, that's the way you purchase something like a house or a community asset. Now, uh, we won't have an asset coming out of this, the state government will, but they'll also have the borrowings, which is appropriate. Um, so that is what has happened here. So there is no $200 million sitting in an account somewhere. It's just $200 million that we wouldn't have to borrow otherwise. Good thing, yeah? Yeah, no, apparently not according to Councillor Cassidy. Uh, but I can assure him that it won't in any way lessen the investment we're making in the community and on critical infrastructure because since we budgeted that $200 million, uh, as a potential fund for Olympic uh, investment, uh, there is something important that has come to light since that time which we will now need to borrow money to invest in. Uh, and that is the Woolloongabba metro station and transport improvements. Uh, now, a little bit of a history lesson. When we first proposed Metro, we proposed a station for the Gabba. What happened? Well, long story short, state said, rack off. Um, we don't want you building anything or doing anything in the Gabba because that's ours. That is ours. Um, thankfully, that attitude has now changed and they want to work with us on Brisbane Metro. And the Brisbane Metro is now a joint project between Council, the state government and the federal government and jointly we will be uh, building transport improvements and a new station at the Gabba. The cost to Brisbane City Council and indeed the additional borrowings that we will have to make for this uh, is no less than 150 million. Uh, so uh, certainly there will be a significant investment being made but I stress again this is borrowed money. This is not money sitting in an account that we can just tap into. 
Uh, these are borrowings um, for investment in infrastructure. We will be investing, uh, so we will be putting that $150 million towards the GABA transport improvements, just as the state government will be putting in $150 million and the federal government $150 million as well. So uh, that will be a good outcome. It will support better transport. I know Councillor Cassidy doesn't support the Brisbane Metro, uh, but Mark Bailey does. Uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk does. Um, Stephen Miles does. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if Cameron Dick does, but um, we, we certainly know that the key power brokers in the government do support this, uh, and it is a good thing. Um, so we'll be getting on with doing that. Uh, and um, I just want to say again, it is a fantastic outcome that we see South Bank 2.0 land secured by the state government, finally investing in something they should. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My question is also to the Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, earlier this morning you opened the Oswater 22 conference, with Brisbane being host city for the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Could you please inform the Chamber of the importance of having water security for a major, uh, major scale event of this type? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Adaman for the question. Now, um, with the current rainfall that we've had um, and that is expected over the coming days, and with the recent flooding that we've had, uh, it would be easy when you're focused on the future to be thinking more about flooding than other climate change challenges. Uh, but we need to be focused on all challenges. And one of those challenges that is very real for South East Queensland going forward is the challenge not only of flood or storm, but also of drought. The climate continues to change. Uh, and in the last 30 years, we have seen a, a significant reduction in the rainfall that South East Queensland gets to the point where uh, we've seen almost a 10 per cent reduction in average rainfall in South East Queensland. Now, obviously, you know, this year is different to that, um, but we live in this, this world of, of a changing climate. But if you look at those last 30 years, uh, there have been nine years that have been very wet years uh, that have had far more uh, rainfall than normal. But out of the last 30 years, there's been 14 years that are very dry, 14 years of drought. And so uh, we all remember the time when uh, we had the millennium drought in the mid-2000s, and this region very nearly ran out of water. Now, what nobody seems to be talking about when it comes to the legacy of the Olympics is an opportunity to create water security for our region. Yes, I want better sporting venues. Yes, I want better transport and roads. Yes, I want community parks and, and facilities like South Bank 2.0. But you know what I also want? Water security for South East Queensland. Because I can tell you right now, uh, for the last three years, the dam levels, the combined dam levels in South East Queensland dropped below 60 per cent each summer. And it was only in October last year that Wyvernhoe went down to 40%. So in October last year it was 40%. By February it was 120%. That is climate change and that is the way that um, our climate will continue to change. So while we must plan for, for drought, we must plan for flood, we must plan for bushfire, uh, we must plan for security for our region. And so some difficult but important conversations need to, have, uh, need to happen. What is the future of improving water capacity and security in our region? Do we need new dams built in South East Queensland? Do we need new desalination plants built in South East Queensland? Our population is growing. It is the fastest growing city, which is at the heart of the fastest growing region in Australia. And so as more people come on board, what are the plans to increase our water security and improve our water security? And also, I mentioned dams and desalination plants, but also, what about recycled drinking water? We have a, a network in place. It hasn't been switched on. What is the future? We need to be asking these questions. We need to be having these debates, because in the next 10 years between now and the Olympics, we know one thing's for certain. Our population will continue to grow, more people coming here, more demand on water, but there are no plans for increased water storage or increased water security. So that is a discussion we need to have, uh, and I'm certainly happy to have it, just like I'm happy to raise issues that 
maybe other people don't want to talk about, like daylight saving. Um, water security, some people don't want to talk about it, happy to talk about it. We need to have this discussion because it is critical for our growing region. It is just as important as other types of infrastructure and it is something that we need to discuss. So what's the plan going forward? How are we going to uh, cater for the increased demand, the increased growth, but also the last thing we want to see is the athletes turning up to the Olympic Village and being issued with those little four minute egg timers saying, welcome to Brisbane, have a short shower, no more than four minutes. Um, that happened in, in recent living memory. We don't want it to happen again. Uh, water security needs to be on the agenda. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, as I'm sure you are aware, May is Domestic and Family Violence Awareness Month. It has now been three years since Labor moved a motion in this place calling on Council to create a domestic violence strategy for the city. The strategy received bipartisan support and it has been acknowledged previously as a starting point and was never intended to be a static document. Lord Mayor, what steps have you taken to review and update the domestic violence strategy to reflect the current needs of our city? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, uh, well, thank, thank you, Councillor Cook, for the question through you, Mr Chair. Uh, obviously, this is something that is never far from all of our minds. It is never far. And as we do our work each week in the community and we continue to engage uh, with so many of the charities that are at the front line on the war and the fight against domestic violence um, and on, on the ongoing campaign uh, to stamp out and say no uh, to this scourge in our society, uh, we will continue to support the amazing work that has been happening and we will continue also as an organisation to do the necessary things that we need to do uh, in the fight against domestic violence. Uh, and that covers a myriad of different things. Uh, we have a strategy, we are faithfully implementing that strategy. Uh, we are always looking for ways to improve. Uh, and I also want to commend uh, the Premier as well today uh, for taking um, action when it comes to coercive control and legislation on coercive control. I know that is one of the key things that came out of the tragedy that we saw with Hannah Clark and her three beautiful children. Uh, this issue of coercive control and outlawing it and working legislative ways to prevent it from happening, we now have, uh, we now have a path forward on that and legislation will be introduced into the state parliament. So we stand uh, ready to continue doing our part working as an organisation but also supporting the community and working with other levels of government uh, because this is an ongoing battle. It will require uh, continued uh, push and focus uh, and we are absolutely determined to continue uh, doing our part. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, the Shrinner Council is making sure there is more to see and do across our city. Could you please update the Chamber on what is on offer for Brisbane residents during the month of May? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hutton, for the question, because May is one of the most exciting months on the event calendar. And this May, even though it's been a slower start to the year, is absolutely action-packed, uh, proving once again that Brisbane is the home of major events, and we are definitely leading the race as the sporting capital of Australia. Um, this weekend, we are gearing up for the blockbuster showdown in the NRL Magic Round, bringing three jam-packed days full of football and celebrations to the heart of Brisbane. All 16 NRL teams playing eight games over three days here at Suncorp Stadium. It is a frenzy of fantastic football, no matter who you barrack for. This is now in its third year, one of the city's biggest and best events, and not only for footy fans, but for our local pubs, clubs, hotel operators, and everything in between. No other city in Australia comes close to matching what we can offer here right in Brisbane, but we know they're all lining up to take a bid at hosting the NRL Magic Round in future years. And we'll be working very hard with TEQ, as we do in Brisbane Economic Development Agency, to make sure that we throw everything at it as well, to urge our locals and visitors alike to get out there and enjoy the footy festivities. And I recognise uh, the Premier's support yesterday to keep it here in Brisbane, which is absolutely fantastic. I hope she just doesn't go claiming that it was her work that got it here for the next two years, because it's already here for the next two years. 
issues. Uh, it's after that that we need to make sure it stays here in Brisbane as well. And of course, this weekend, there is a bit of impending wet weather. We, that won't dampen our spirits. Uh, Saturday tickets to the Premiership, Heavyweights Melbourne and Penrith are already sold out. Friday and Sunday night matches, not far behind. And the biggest sale we've ever seen on three-day ticket events. So a huge cash bonanza for Brisbane. Uh, with the aim to inject more than $20 million into our local economy, over 100,000 bed nights filling our hotels in previous years, so we're expecting more this year as well. And while there'll be plenty of action on the field at Suncorp, there will also be plenty of things to see and do around the city if rugby league isn't quite your thing. So if you step out of the stadium, you can discover what else Brisbane has to offer. This weekend is the first um, of the big run of weekends for the Stradbroke season for Brisbane Racing Club. Uh, this Saturday is the Doombin 10,000, where we'll see the fastest sprinters in Australasia compete for the chance to triumph in one of the top 100 races in the world, possibly a dead track at the rate we're going at the moment. Uh, but if you prefer to immerse yourself in the best food and drink on offer, head down to South Bank Parklands for Regional Flavours Festival, bringing together some of Australia's most renowned chefs, local producers, winemakers, brewers and distillers to showcase the flavours of their region. This year's event has taken on a fresh look, exploring, exploring a new theme of the ultimate grazing table, where you can spend a day or even just an afternoon um, lazing and grazing with exclusive experiences catering for all. There are free and ticket events to attend where you can meander through a dozen of different market stalls or participate in a range of masterclasses for whatever suits your culinary likings. Uh, the month of May extends on this as well and just gets better for the foodies as the ever popular Dine b and &E City is back bigger and better in 2022. This extended month-long program is packed with more than 100 exclusive offers and dining experiences, giving you more than 100 reasons to dine out this month with the selection of more than 65 participating restaurants and bars banding together to entice you into Brisbane City to experience the culinary delights. From $25 lunches to after-work drinks and tapas pairings, Whiskey nights, 10 course digger stations, there is definitely something for everyone. And this is your chance to throw your support behind the city and help our local restaurateurs get back on track. Rounding out the action punch month of May, but wait, there's more. There is a uh, the steak knives at the end. We've got the seat of the city, which will return on Sunday, the 29th of May, for its fourth year. Stretching along the stunning city reach from Eagle Street Pier to Customs House, pop up sites with market stores, live music, entertainments as you feast your way on the best seafood in town. Think Morton Bay bugs, fresh oysters, all along a dedicated alfresco food trail. Smart to get in there this year because, of course, we'll see Eagle Street under a bit of construction next year. But it has been a tough year for the start of the year for so many, including our restaurateurs, hoteliers and bars. Please remember, campaigns like these are important to keep our local economy ticking and they're a reminder to Brisbane residents to get out and about and experience their own backyard. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently Federal Labor leader Anthony Albanese announced plans to build electric buses in Perth for Perth. Uh, over on this side of the country, the Labor government uh, is getting electric buses manufactured here in Queensland and trains built here too, of course. Meanwhile, your LNP administration tears up a 30-year manufacturing partnership with local Brisbane bus builders and buys electric buses from China and Europe when they could be made here. The comparison between your LMP leadership and Labor leadership could not be more stark. Labor supports local jobs and you and the LMP snub them. Lord Mayor, what do you hope to achieve by snubbing local manufacturing jobs? Thank you. Lord Mayor. <clears throat> well, Mr Chair, um, as usual and as we've come to expect, uh, there is a lot of uh, misinformation in that question. Um, but that's not unusual. Uh, we've heard, for example, Councillor Cassidy in the past, both here in the chamber and in the media, saying that jobs have been lost at Volgren. Jobs have been lost. Well, I, I wonder, Councillor Cassidy, how many jobs have been lost at Volgren? Because I'm not aware of one single job that has been lost at Volgren. And when I was out there at the manufacturing facility the other day where they were fitting out the Metro vehicle, I didn't see a single job. 
that has been lost. I didn't see a single bit of evidence that any jobs have been lost. So please, tell the truth, Councillor Cassidy. Tell the truth. So, we uh, are, co are committed to pu uh, supporting public transport and also modernising our fleet. Uh, we have a, a trial of four, four buses, four Councilor buses, Cassidy, please. where we went out to a national and international tender. How many, <laughs> how many uh, complying local buses came back in that tender? One, two, three, Councilor. none, not one. Not one local company could Councilor provide Cassidy, a compliant please. bus at the time we went out for this trial. Same thing happened with the Brisbane Metro when we went out to tender for that vehicle. How many local companies could provide what we're asking for? Five, six, seven? Not one. Not one. But you know what? The good news is Volgren is involved in the Metro vehicle. Volgren is part of a joint venture arrangement to provide these vehicles for Brisbane Metro. And the Volgren workers uh, were supporting us when it comes to doing all the necessary fit out and technical work that had to happen on the Metro pilot vehicle. So this, this claim that jobs are being lost or jobs are somehow under threat is absolute rubbish. It is rubbish. Uh, now, we know that um, the leader of the opposition, the federal leader of the opposition, um, probably doesn't know what the unemployment rate is, <laughs> but it is 4%. Now, that would indicate that there's not a great deal of people out of work at the moment across the country. That would indicate. Now, we are every day supporting local jobs when we do our procurement, which is why now over 80% of our contracts go to uh, local companies and also companies that are based here locally. And when we go out to tender for our next bus building operations, uh, we're looking forward to being able to, hopefully, Councillor Murphy, award the contract to suitable local manufacturers. Uh, but what we have got now is, uh, would you think, according to what Councillor Cassidy says, we've ordered 100, 200 buses from overseas? No, at the moment, five. Five. There's four on trial and there's one Metro pilot vehicle. Why? Because we went out to tender, no local companies could provide what we need. When we go out to tender in the future, I have every confidence Council they Strunk. will be. Uh, so let's stop the, mis the, the, the dishonest misinformation, the fear campaign. Um, we, know, we know that when it comes to Labor's agenda, it's all about fear and smear. Uh, but there is no basis to it. There is absolutely no basis to it. They talk about loss of local manufacturing jobs. No jobs have been lost when it comes to our contracts, particularly when it comes to public transport or Volgren. No jobs have been lost to Volgren. And I would, I would actually challenge Councillor Cassidy to provide any evidence that any jobs have been lost to Volgren. There is no evidence. It's a busy factory Silence over there. Silence on all sides, please. It's a busy factory with lots of people working hard um, on different buses for different places and including the Metro pilot vehicle. So it's just like uh, this misinformation that we hear from Labor all the time about outsourcing. When they Councillor were the Cassidy, don't test my patience. They uh, were the biggest me, outsourcers of all. Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, uh, I consider you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.4 of the meeting local law, I hereby request that you cease interjecting during the response that the Lord Mayor is providing to your question. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. But um, Councillor Cassidy uh, it suggests that um, his Labor state government um, has only purchased local electric buses. I would ask whether that is entirely true. I would ask whether that is entirely true, um, because there's a line of questioning here um, and uh, strong evidence around the place to support that that is not in fact the case. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, Lord, Lord Mayor, your time has you. expired. Further questions, <laughs> Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of City Standards, Councillor Marks. Councillor Marks, the Shrinic Council's food waste recycling pilot has seen thousands of Brisbane residents reduce the amount of food waste going to landfill helping keep Brisbane clean, green and sustainable. 
Could you please update the Chamber on the latest in this pilot? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair, and through you, I thank Councillor Toomey for the question. The Shrina Council has a strong record of taking action to reduce waste and pollution. So food waste in Brisbane currently makes up around a quarter of the household's general waste bin and has significant impacts on our limited landfill, natural resources, the economy and our environment. That is why it is important that there is a tailored action to assist our city's future waste and resource recovery service. So the food waste recycling pilot is about diverting food waste, such as fruit and vegetable scraps, out of the general waste bin, away from landfill, and disposing it through our green waste bin program. What better way to support the environment and take the next step in improving our recycling efforts by delivering a program with an immediate impact in our communities? So this pilot is not only an opportunity to explore how we can provide a service to minimise, minimise food waste, but also to educate residents on how they can reduce this at the same time. So I'm pleased to share with the Chamber that across the trial wards there's been a high level of positive feedback reported to date, and this is something a trial that the residents are excited about. I want to acknowledge um, those Brisbane residents who have been participating in the pilot since March. It is clear that Brisbane residents engaging with this pilot are keen to do their best to reduce landfill. Preliminary reports suggest that the levels of contamination have also been extremely low, which is extremely important. Council will undertake an audit on the amount of food waste received in the coming months, and I'll bring the results back to the Chamber when they become available in a future update. Mr Chair, you may be wondering how the food waste recycling program works. Well, each participating household received a kitchen caddy and an education pack prior to the service commencing in early March. Residents can place their food waste, including fruit and vegetable scraps, along with their garden waste into their green bin, and then the green bin was collected as part of, obviously, the normal fortnightly uh, bin collection process. The Shrina Council is absolutely committed to making sure that the pilot program evaluates all feedback received from stakeholders. Officers will also use this feedback to ensure that the full-scale program will deliver the best possible service for the residents of Brisbane. And residents can engage with Council to provide their feedback via form or join our online community of participants via the Council's Engagement HQ platform, where like-minded users can help troubleshoot and share tips. As our food waste pioneers, these households are going to play a vital role in providing us with all the feedback, information and data we need to deliver the best possible food waste recycling service for our city. This pilot will add to the work we've already done when it comes to recycling food and garden waste, including the free kitchen waste caddies and rebates of up to $70 when you purchase a compost bin or a worm farm. The Shrina Council wants to help residents divert flood waste from landfill and our food waste recycling program will help build a cleaner, greener future for Brisbane. Brisbane is going to become the home of the nation's biggest ever food waste recycling service. I am aware that there are calls for full, what they is referred to as FOGO, to be rolled out across Brisbane. Um, at this point in time, we're trialling this food waste recycling program, and that is purely so we can do a number of things. We can ensure that there is a very low contamination rate, um, which having visited a site where food waste um, goes to from uh, Ballina, um, there is a fair bit of contamination happening down there, which is not great. So our, go our residents have been 100% um, on track with very low contamination. The other issue with turning on something across the city of our size is where is it all going to go? Um, we have to make sure we have an end market for the product. Um, we're, at the moment, we're talking a few thousand tonnes. We're going to ultimately talk about some hundreds of thousands of tonnes of food waste. It all needs to go somewhere. So we're working with industry um, to get that end pro product um, placement happening. Um, and the other situation we have, of course, is the rental properties and um, what we call our MUDs, our multi-unit development, uh, uh, developments. So we are working on both of those issues because um, ultimately we would like the whole city involved in this um, program. But as I said, for us, as a personally as a chair of city standards, we do it once, we do it right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor March. Further questions? Councillor Johnston. <clears throat> yes, uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, just a few weeks ago, uh, you and your uh, LNP Council moved a motion, amending my motion, saying 
uh, that Council not fund the backflow valves recommended out of the 2011 uh, flood report. Uh, today, in the report uh, issued by Councillor, uh, sorry, by uh, former Chief Justice Paul De Jersey, he uh, recommends that Council continues to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow valves as part of Brisbane's flood mitigation strategy. Um, you described uh, these backflow valves as going blindly. Uh, the Deputy Mayor described them in even worse terms, um, and you voted against installing them. Now that Paul de Jersey has recommended they be installed, will you ensure that they are fully funded in the budget and delivered as recommended both in 2011 and in 2022? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr Chair. Uh, well, I suggest that Councillor Johnson should properly read the report um, before she asks a question like that, uh, because uh, as we pointed out before, um, we took the recommendations after 2011, uh, we assessed uh, the um, high priority locations and we rolled out the backflow valves and there are 66 devices in those high priority locations. And let's just read what the report, let's not worry about speculation, let's read what the report says here. The AECOM report identified uh, 51, although it speaks of 52 drainage systems for which installation of backflow valves was feasible. AECOM foresaw that in working out a priority for installation, Council would consider a cost-benefit analysis, the number of properties impacted by floods, the cost of installation, operational issues and previously programmed drainage network upgrades of flood impacted infrastructure. Having on that basis identified 12 priority stormwater systems, Council installed devices in them and three others. In all, there are 66 backflow devices installed along the Brisbane River. Of the 15 devices installed uh, post-2011, uh, seven demonstrably mitigated the effect of flooding in 2022. The effect of the rest could not be gauged either because the river levee overtopped, rendering the device ineffectual in five cases, or because the device being passive, meaning manual intervention was not needed for activation, uh, and there were no nearby monitoring gauges in four cases. From the evidence currently available to Council, no properties were worse off during 2022 as a consequence of the installation of a backflow device. Council has a detailed dedicated web page relating to backflow devices which explains the concept of backflow flooding, lists locations where they are installed and provides information and responses to questions frequently asked about backflow. Council estimates that of the backflow device locations referred to above, flood heights reduced between 0 0.9 and, 0, and 0.99 metres and 1,275 properties benefited which is obviously a very good result. The backflow devices installed since 2011 serviced 13,376 properties at a cost of approximately 19.2 million. Point of order for you, Councillor Johnston. I, I appreciate the history lesson. My question was, though, um, it's been recommended in the De Jersey review that they are prioritised and installed, and will the Lord Mayor be ensuring that they are fully funded, was my question, uh, not what happened in 2011. The, the Lord Mayor is addressing the De Jersey report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, the councillor may not want to hear from the independent report, but it is relevant and it is appropriate. It has been urged by respondents to this review that council can, uh, should proceed to install devices at all of the determined locations identified as feasible. That is another 37. Is this relevant to what we're talking about? Yes. That's what councillor Johnson is asking. All. Council estimates that this would cost in the order of 21.6 million at 2011 costs, so uh, double or triple that, for an expected benefit of only 252 properties. So let's go back. Our current devices protect 13,376 properties. We could spend 20, 30, 40 million to protect 252 properties. That's what Councillor Johnson is suggesting we do blindly. What I can say we will do is we will assess the priority going forward and we will provide appropriate funding to put the devices where they will have the most differences, difference and provide the most benefit. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Owen. Order. Sorry? 
Point of order. Point of order for you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. Um, I seek leave to uh, suspend standing orders uh, to enable me to move an urgency motion, uh, calling on Council to implement Recommendation 3.1 uh, of the 2022 Flood Review, calling on Brisbane City Council uh, to ensure that backflow prevention devices are assessed and prioritised uh, and installed as part of Council's flood mitigation strategy. Seconded. Councillor Johnson, you're moving a motion to su for suspension of standing rules. You have three minutes to justify why you need to suspend standing rules. Uh, so just under two thank, you, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just under two hours ago, um, Justice Paul de Jersey uh, uh, handed down, well, I, actually, I don't know when he handed it down, but we were publicly told um, about the uh, 2022 uh, flood uh, review. One of the recommendations which the Lord Mayor did not address, he just read out a whole heap of stuff which I don't have a problem with, he just literally read it out of the report, but the thing that he ignored was the recommendation um, from Justice de, Jer de Jersey and it's on page uh, 59 and other pages but I'm going to read it out. Um, the recommendation from the independent flood review is um, 3.1 backflow prevention devices that Council continues to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. Now, currently, uh, the Brisbane City Council position, um, which the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor uh, voted for just a few weeks ago, was to not install backflow prevention devices, to not install them. It was a very deliberate decision to not install them, as Councillor uh, Adams spent quite some time explaining to us. Um, now, let me be clear here. The uh, recommendation by uh, Justice de Jersey is that they are assessed and prioritised. Now, we know that the Lord Mayor says he's going to implement these recommendations, but when he was asked about funding them as a matter of priority, he did not say that he would. Um, not a single backflow prevention device in my ward is actually included on any capital works list um, for this council or any infrastructure list or the long-term infrastructure list. They are just not listed. If they're not listed, they're not going to be funded. Now, um, Justice de Jersey has certainly acknowledged that they worked well um, where there was data available. He has acknowledged that where they were in, they prevented flooding for people. He has acknowledged um, that uh, there are some where we didn't have that information. Obviously, we need to make sure that the telemetry is put in those devices to make sure we can track how they work as well. But it is critically important that the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor don't gloss over this review that acknowledges the importance of them in our flood mitigation strategy, that says that they will work, that recognises that they would only cost about $20 million to deliver. I mean, this is an administration that only spends $30 million all up on, on drainage every year, so of course that looks like a lot of money, um, but the Lord Mayor would spend more uh, on, on advertising that he spends on backflow devices. 3.1 says that Council should assess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of the flood mitigation strategy. And the current position of this Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor and every LNP councillor is they not be installed. We Councillor need to send Gu a clear Johnson, message your that time we will do this. Has expired. The motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour of the suspension of standing rules, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Johnson. Uh, point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, as per section 42 2B of the Meeting Local Law 2001, I move a procedural motion that the debate on the, uh, on the motion now before the meeting be adjourned until the conclusion of business on today's agenda. Second it. So the motion before us now is to... Um, that this uh, motion has been accepted, but to move it for debate at the end of today's agenda. All in favour of that motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Cook. Uh, please ring the bells. Ayes to my right, noes to the left.
Silence, please, while the bell's ringing. Clarks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the vo voting being 19 in favour and 7 against. Thank you. Um, that moves the motion that Councillor Johnson moved that Brisbane City Council prioritise and fund backflow prevention devices as recommended in 3.1 of the New Jersey 2022 flood review to the end of today's agenda. That ends question time. Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee Report of the 3rd of May 2022. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting... Seconded. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Tuesday 3 May 2022 be adopted. Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Before I move on, uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, the recommendation of the De Jersey Review on Backflow to Valves says this, that Council continue, continue, as in it's doing it already, to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. Yes, we will be doing that. I can tell you, we will be doing that. Uh, so um, any such motion, I think, is unnecessary. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, we know that what Councillor Johnston was wanting us to do is to blindly just sign off on everything without an appropriate priority assessment. We're not going to do that. We're going to continue doing the assessment on priority and building uh, where you get the best results. So, uh, moving forward, um, this week... Councillor Johnston. Uh, I'd like to update you on the, uh, the great community causes we continue to support as a city. Uh, last night, the Victoria Bridge, Radcliffe Place, Story Bridge and Tropical Display Dome we lit up in the colour teal. And it wasn't for the election, I can tell you right now. Um, uh, the colour teal was to mark Allergy Awareness Month. Um, Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of people with an allergy, uh, with more than 5 million Australians living with allergy. Uh, tonight, those same assets will be lit up in blue not for the election again, um, sorry to say, uh, but to celebrate the Anywhere Festival. Uh, this artistic, artistic festival is about public performances in all locations other than a theatre. Uh, Milton, Morningside, Woolloongabba, Windsor, St Lucia are just some of the Brisbane suburbs participating in the An Anywhere Festival. Uh, tomorrow night, the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, Radcliffe Place will be lit up in blue again, but this time uh, to support the eve of Fibromyalgia International Awareness Day, um, also known as Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. There are about 250,000 Australians living with this disease and the effect can last uh, more than six months at a time. Uh, on Thursday, all our assets will be lit up in the colour blue again, but this time for a different reason. Yeah. Do it for Dolly Day. Do it for Dolly Day is about bringing the community together to celebrate kindness and unite in taking a stand against bullying. The suicide of young Dolly was a national tragedy, which we all remember, and brought on this issue of uh, online bullying to the front pages of the paper. Um, and there's been uh, a lot of discussion about it ever since, but uh, we need to continue doing more in this space. Uh, this Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we're lighting up City Hall, Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, Tropical Dome and Redcliffe Place in green to support the NRL Magic Round. Um, now, I know uh, Councillor Adams is not here, but she is very excited about this. Um, and this event is a staple in Brisbane's event calendar and is the world's largest festival of rugby league, uh, which is here in Brisbane. Now, um, there's been speculation about whether other states are going to steal this office. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, we won't let that happen, neither will the state government. Okay, uh, just moving forward to the items in front of us. Um, the first one, item A, is the approval to grant 
a trustee lease for the Queensland Police Memorial. Uh, the Queensland Pro Police Memorial pays tribute to the memory of police officers who have died in duty or on duty, with records dating back as far as 1859. The previous memorial, moral, uh, sorry, the previous memorial uh, was located in front of 80 George Street and was decommissioned to make way for the Queens Wharf uh, development project. Following this, a new memorial was constructed in the City Botanic Gardens in 2018 and was opened on the 24th of November 2018. Uh, the City Botanic Gardens is identified as reserved under the Land Act 1994 and Council is the trustee of the land. QPS wish to retain ownership and management of the memorial. They require a trust lease from Council to do this. Uh, the trust lease has been drafted for the maximum term allowed under the Act, which is 30 years, um, which allows them to provide for the ongoing management and maintenance of the memorial, which we think is appropriate. As QPS is a state government department, it meets the exemption criteria under the City of Brisbane Regulation 2012, and this enables Council to directly grant a lease with, with the QPS uh, without undertaking a tender process. Uh, item B uh, relates to uh, approval for the Deputy Mayor uh, to travel to uh, the meeting of the World Union of Olympic Cities, uh, as Brisbane is now a new member of that uh, organisation. Uh, they are also uh, at the same time celebrating their 20th anniversary. Uh, as host city for the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, Brisbane was invited to become a member of the World Union of Olympic Cities, uh, joining previous host cities uh, to those that are on the path to hosting a future Games. Now obviously uh, there's a lot of learnings from every city that has hosted the Games and this is one of those important forums uh, that we can make those uh, engagements and have those relationships and to learn those learnings. Uh, membership of this association gives Council access to invaluable tools and resources connecting with former and future host cities uh, as well as the IOC and the uh, world of international support. Uh, we will be, well, we are the 44th and newest member of the union. Uh, union proud, union strong um, and we are, we've been invited to attend the 20th anniversary and so the Deputy Mayor uh, will be travelling uh, to be part of that important event and also to accept uh, the membership for the City of Brisbane. Um, so that is uh, before us. Uh, finally item C is the uh, Eagle Street Pier and Waterfront Place surrender and granting of subleases and partial surrender of lease. Uh, this rela relates to um, what some people would publicly know as the DEXIS proposal or the DEXIS redevelopment uh, down in the waterfront um, in that Eagle Street Pier precinct. By approving these various leases and subleases and the tenure arrangements, uh, we're supporting the revitalisation of the Brisbane waterfront, uh, which will help transform this iconic Brisbane location and ensure that it is not only a premium destination for business and offices, but also to enhance the precinct from a lifestyle pers uh, perspective as well. We know that um, we have many great sections of Riverwalk along the waterfront, but this particular section uh, is, uh, I guess, underdone and overused when it comes to um, the amount of space that's available. And so what we've made it clear we want to see there is a significant improvement in the public realm and also when it comes to the ability for people to walk and cycle and scooter through that area. And this uh, proposal and what we've uh, insisted uh, through the DEXIS development proposal will help achieve that outcome. Uh, and most importantly, it will help achieve that outcome through private investment into the public realm, which I think is a really positive thing. We know that the public, uh, the people of Brisbane love the Brisbane waterfront and this will take a significant section of the Brisbane waterfront and invest tens of millions of dollars in upgrading the public realm, in providing wider and safer paths for people to walk along and providing enhanced experience, an enhanced experience for the uh, people of Brisbane. So these uh, subleases facilitate that outcome. Uh, the uh, current leases date back to 1990 uh, where, um, when we saw the first um, work being carried out there, uh, the subleases were due to expire in 2065, um, and to enable this investment to go ahead, uh, we're obviously putting this arrangement in place. 
The Deputy Premier and Local Government Minister Stephen Miles um, provided the required exemption um, to go directly to DEXIS on this arrangement and to make this happen. The riverbed leases being approved today ensure that millions can be invested into public open space on the river's edge. Uh, the City Reach boardwalk will be rebuilt and extended uh, and will be at least six metres wide and up to 15 metres wide in its widest point. Now, currently, it is a three metre path. So we're seeing at minimum a doubling of the pathway space and obviously the number of people using it and the, the conflict that's happening there at the moment between different modes of travel necessitates this. Uh, and but we get this outcome through private investment, as I said, which is a good outcome. The project will also uh, create up to 1,000 jobs during construction and 900 ongoing jobs once complete. Uh, construction is expected at this point in time to commence uh, later this year. Uh, so uh, we ask for councillor support for this um, surrender and granting of subleases. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. I'll speak on these items before us today and ask that item B be taken seriatim for voting, please. B seriatim for voting. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, on Clause A, we support uh, the granting of the trustee lease for the Queensland Police Memorial. I remember uh, when the Queensland Police Service, supported by the Queensland Police Union, uh, of employees approached council initially about having this memorial placed in the, in the City Botanic Gardens. Uh, the, the LNP mayor at the time uh, kicked up a big stink and didn't want, didn't want this uh, memorial in the City Botanic Gardens, I recall that. Uh, and uh, Graham Quirk, the LNP mayor at the time, supported by most of these LNP councillors still here, had to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, to have a memorial in, in the City Botanic Gardens. Uh, memorialising all of those men and women of the Queensland Police Service and their predecessors and the Queensland Police Force uh, um, who have died in the line of duty. Um, and I do remember some spurious arguments about turning the City Botanic Gardens into a graveyard by having a memorial like this. Well, the memorial that is there um, uh, is, is a very fitting tribute uh, to those officers who have served and died. Uh, we supported it from the outset, Labor councillors, uh, and certainly support um, the granting of this trustee lease uh, to the QPS to uh, ensure that they um, they can appropriately manage and maintain this memorial uh, in an appropriate way. So we'll support this item. Uh, clause B is the overseas travel. It's a part of the, the Olympics consolation prize, I think, uh, because what we have, what we have is the deputy mayor, who's not a member of uh, the OCOG, the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games OCOG. We know that uh, the deputy mayor did want to be part of that, um, but is not part of the organising committee for the Brisbane uh, 2032 games. Um, so, so the two the two nominees this council did have for um, for that committee that that the Lord Mayor could nominate was himself, of course, uh, and the Mayor of Redlands, Karen Williams. Um, so perhaps perhaps we should be sending someone to this forum that is actually a member of the organising committee. Uh, we know there's some internal LNP politics at play. Uh, some internal politics at play when it came to who the Lord Mayor could and couldn't choose. We know there was a pre-selection going on uh, down in the Bayside suburbs and uh, certain consolation prizes had to be given out left, right and centre and the Deputy Mayor couldn't get a Guernsey on the OCOG so this committee was set up in council that, that, uh, that the Deputy Mayor could chair which really has no practical um, uh, practical way of, of organising or implementing anything to do with the Olympics has become very, very clear uh, for us as members of that committee. Um, but it certainly looks like this is a consolation prize and the Deputy Mayor probably isn't the appropriate person for Council to be sending uh, to this forum. It, it probably should be the Lord Mayor himself. So uh, we won't be supporting this item uh, before us today because we don't think uh, these little prizes should be doled out um, uh, as, as deals done behind closed doors. Uh, we think that uh, everything about the Olympics should be open and transparent. Uh, Clause C, the Eagle Street Pier and Waterfront Place uh, leases. Um, we've been broadly supportive of this project from the outset as well, as the, as the Lord Mayor described, people know it publicly as the DEXIS project. Um, I know the LNP have gone hot and cold on it over the, over the years. I met the proponents early on uh, and listened to what they had to say about what they wanted to achieve um, down at that site, including um, uh, the, the giving back of some road space to active 
um, transport users for pedestrians and cyclists and more open space um, on either side of the development, and, and I know the LNP have balked at that along the way. Um, but in terms of the, the leases uh, and the, and the subleases uh, being renewed to ensure that this project goes ahead, it's something that we'll be supporting. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak on item A, the approval to grant a trustee lease for the Queensland Police Memorial, because the Schooner Council recognises the importance of memorials, monuments and plaques in commemoration of our city's history, of its culture, environment, people, organisations and events. And the Queensland Police Service recognises the unique nature of, police, uh, of the police service and uh, the dangers that police face daily serving um, our community. As the Lord Mayor said, uh, the former police memorial was located in front of 80 George Street, but was decommissioned to make way for the Queen's Wharf um, development. And Council worked with uh, the State Government uh, and the Queensland Police Union, uh, along with the Heritage Council, uh, to consider potential new sites. And in 2018, uh, the construction of the new memorial commenced in the City Botanic Gardens and was formally dedicated in November 2018. And Mr Chair, the Queensland Police Service wished to continue ownership and management of the memorial, including maintenance and upkeep, uh, and to enable this to occur, a 30-year trustee uh, lease arrangement has been recommended to Council today. Mr Chair, the memorial is a very special place uh, dedicated to the memory of fallen police officers, and uh, each pillar represents a rank within the Queensland Police Service, from constable to commissioner. It's uh, the layout of the pillars uh, in relation to the light that um, that uh, comes through creates a bit of a checkered effect, which really um, subtly represents the blue and white uh, checkered iconic um, band of the Queensland Police Service. Um, it is a place of reflection uh, for families and friends of officers who have died uh, during their service um, uh, to the Queensland community, and I encourage all councillors to support uh, this recommendation. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Further speakers? <coughs> Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on um, uh, all items in the ENC report. I'd also ask that item C is taken seriatim. Uh, I'm happy for it to be with B, but I don't know what um, other members of council want to do, so seriatim. For B? C. C. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, firstly, item A. I support item A. Uh, no problems there. It's uh, uh, reflecting a request from the police. Item B. I think it's quite interesting um, that over the last few weeks, Right in the middle of flood recovery, we've seen uh, a lot of um, meetings and junkets to Sydney, now you know overseas, uh, about the Olympics. We're not really we're not really seeing a lot of um, uh, focus on on flood recovery, and it is really concerning to me uh, that. Uh, yet again, the priority is for the Deputy Mayor to go off on another overseas trip with very little value to Brisbane. Um, she is not a member of the organising uh, committee. Uh, this is, and I quote, an anniversary celebration program. I mean, with the fairy lights in, where was that, Taiwan? You remember that one about a decade ago? That's probably pre you, Councillor Cook. That was a really good one. She went off to see the fairy lights in, to I think it was Taiwan. I, I might have the country wrong, but that was a great trip. She needed to go and do that. She had to look at the fairy lights. Um, this time round, she has to go because there's a party on for the Olympics and Councillor Krista Adams is essential to the party for the anniversary celebrations for the Olympics. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to help us uh, deliver on our Olympics responsibilities here in the city of Brisbane, and I'm definitely not sure about how that's going to help us deliver on the business of the city of Brisbane, and I'm definitely sure um, that it's not going to help us deliver on flood recovery, although now having just said that out loud, it might be a good thing that she's not here uh, working on those issues. Um, but I am appalled that in the middle of uh, 
a debate about how our city recovers from a catastrophic natural disaster where every single cent that we have um, uh, and time and effort should be going into flood recovery, the deputy mayor is going off on a junket overseas. For the 20, 20th anniversary celebration program uh, in Athens in Greece in a couple of weeks' time. I look forward to the extensive report that Councillor Adams brings back about the uh, wonderful meetings she attends and, and the hobnobbing she does in Greece. And I look forward to her coming back and explaining to us how going to a party in Greece that is irrelevant uh, to this city, to the delivery of the Olympics Games program, is anything that this city should be doing. It's not acceptable. It is not acceptable that uh, the deputy mayor accepts um, the funding that is being provided to go to this event. Uh, it is not acceptable that she sees this as a valuable use of her time um, as something that needs to be done. Uh, the city of Brisbane is groaning under serious problems, serious problems, and the person who is apparently in charge of the economic development of this city um, is going to go to Greece to see how to have a party. Uh, it's not a good use of the Deputy Mayor's time. It's not an acceptable thing for her to be accepting. You can politely say, thank you for the kind invitation, but we won't be attending. I really don't think the Olympic movement is going to take the Olympic Games off Brisbane if the Deputy Mayor decides she's not going to go to the party in Greece. Um, I'm not aware that uh, the party in Greece has anything to do with the delivery of the Olympics here in Brisbane. I do not support this item and I do not support the decision by the Deputy Mayor to go. And I suggest, a bit like Councillor Wines, who's fled from any discussion about going overseas, he's missing in action. No one wants to remind, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't want to remind anybody about being missing in action as well. Um, but this is not an acceptable thing for the deputy mayor to go to, and it just shows that her judgment about these things is fundamentally flawed. Going to a party in Athens that has nothing to do with the Olympics in Brisbane, um, which are still 11 years away, is absolutely a misstep, flawed judgment and it indicates pretty much everything that's wrong with this LNP administration, that they're more focused on delivering junkets um, for themselves than they are in delivering um, uh, flood recovery for the city. Keep in mind that um, approving the junket for Councillor Adams is more important than talking about the flood recommendations um, in Justice Paul de Jersey's flood review. This is more important. Um, I don't support what's going on here. I do not support um, uh, this decision. I think that Councillor Adams needs to rethink it. Um, and I know they're going to hop up and say, oh, we're not paying for it. Yes, we are. When this city pays out billions of dollars to run the Olympics, how do you think all this stuff is being funded by host cities that have contributed to it? Um, it's going to cost every single ratepayer for you to go on this trip um, because this is the way that these junkets get funded through the Olympics organisations and associations. It's by the contributions that the cities and the businesses make towards the running of the Olympics. This is a bad decision and I don't support it. I also don't support item C. This, this is just going to be a schmozzle. I, just, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Thanks. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise tonight to speak in support of item A. Um, as councillors in this place know, this police memorial is of significance, personal significance to me and my local community because I have a personal connection. Somebody who I worked very closely with for a number of years is named on that memorial. And there can be no greater reflection on the service of our police officers than to remember them in this way. This memorial is very important, not only to our city, but also our state. And it sends a very clear message 
to all of the police officers who have served, who have continued to serve and will continue to serve, but also those who have been lost in the line of duty. There is not a Police Remembrance Day that goes by that I don't pay homage to the service of the wonderful police officers that go to work every day to protect everyone in our community. Their dedication can never be understated and every Police Remembrance Day I will continue to pay honour to my friend Daniel Arthur Stiller and in fact we have the St Sergeant Dan Stiller Memorial Reserve and a memorial in my ward to reflect his dedication to road safety and to the work that he did in our local community. This police rem memorial was very much a project of passion of the former police commissioner Ian Stewart. And I know the many conversations that I had with the former commissioner in regards to this police memorial because he knew that I understood the importance of it and the significance of it. And it is something that when it was unveiled that I had the privilege of being there for that unveiling and seeing it come to fruition. It is a small way that we as a city and that we as a council can honour the service for those who have given their lives in the line of duty, but it also does reflect all of those police officers who have passed away whilst they have been in service, but not specifically at work. I think today's lease and the granting to the QPS is something that solidifies that security for the Queensland Police Service. It sends a message to all our hard-working police officers that we are supportive of them and we are also recognising the memory of each and every name that is not only on that memorial but is read for those in service who also pass away, but not necessarily in the line of duty. Sadly, I've been to a number of police funerals of officers who have passed away in the line of duty. And whilst they are very sombre and significant events, what it does show us all is the significant bond that is there the significant sense of family that those in the police service have for one another and the support that they continue to give to each other. So I take this opportunity tonight, Mr Chair, to say that it is heartwarming to know that this lease is going through this chamber, but also for all of the families for all of the colleagues and for all of the friends of those officers listed on this police memorial, this is also for you. This memorial is a reflection of the dedication of those officers and that their memory will continue in this city for many, many years to come. And our gratitude as a city will be unwavering in part by the granting of this lease. So I think it is very important tonight to make sure that we all take a moment to reflect and honour those who have served and those who continue to serve in our Queensland Police Service. We thank them for their service. We thank them for protecting our community and our city, and we will remember them. Yeah. Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item C. 
This item is the surrender and granting of subleases and partial surrender of lease at Eagle Street Pier and Waterfront Place. As the Lord Mayor has mentioned, this is all about helping to facilitate the $2.1 billion redevelopment of this precinct by Dexas. It's better known as the Waterfront Brisbane Project. Waterfront Brisbane will ensure the golden triangle of Brisbane shines brightly into the future. It will be a top Brisbane lifestyle and business destination in years to come. The item seeks to approve various lease and sublease tenure arrangements for the precinct, which will allow for an expanded riverfront boardwalk. Council currently has a perpetual lease from the state over an area of land between the City Botanic Gardens and Boundary Street. In 1990, Council entered subleases on two lots with Dexas and Perpetual Funds Management. These subleases were due to expire in 2065. As is common for projects with this scale of proposed investment, longer term tenure and certainty is required, and we can understand that. Dexas Council and the State Government have been working together on this for some time. This project was first announced by Dexas with the State Government and Council as a market-led proposal. In December 2019, the State Government announced the signing of a facilitation agreement with Dexas, enabling the company to commence the detailed design and development application process. In 2020, the DEXIS proposal went through Council's development assessment process. This next step involves clarifying the lots and leases for the Waterfront Brisbane project. The existing lot 11 subleased by Council to DEXIS and lot 12 subleased to Perpetual will be surrendered. Council will partially surrender our Perpetual lease from the state in the amount of 1,800 square metres from lot 11. The Deputy Premier and Local Government Minister Stephen Miles has provided the required exemption for Council to sublease directly to Dexas and Perpetual on the new proposed Lot 11 and Lot 12. The new leases will be for 95 years and we have allowed for a market review in rent calculation along the way. As the Lord Mayor has said, this project will improve our public spaces on the riverfront with millions of dollars of investment proposed. The riverbed leases being approved today unlock this investment. The City Reach River Walk will be rebuilt and extended, and the precinct will become much more pedestrian and cycle friendly. It will support hundreds of jobs, both during construction and, of course, more permanently once complete, and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham, further speakers? Any further sp Councillor Sri. Thanks, Chair. I rise just to speak really briefly on all items. Um, the, I'll, I'll just read this passage. Relative to our own, the new speak vocabulary was tiny and new ways of reducing it were constantly being devised. New speak indeed differed from most all other languages in that its vocabulary grew smaller instead of larger every year. Each reduction was a gain since the smaller the area of choice, the smaller the temptation to take thought. Ultimately, it was hoped to make articulate speech issue from the larynx without involving the higher brain centres yeah, at all. Three, you'll need to get to relevance pretty quickly. This, it is relevant. This aim was frankly admitted in the new speak word duck speak, meaning to quack like a duck. Like various other words in the B vocabulary, duck speak was ambivalent in meaning, providing that the opinions which were quacked out were orthodox ones, it implied nothing but praise. And when the Times referred to one of the orators of the party as a double plus good duck speaker, it was paying a warm and valued Excuse compliment. Councillor Sri, uh, you haven't yet established a connection with I'll any of the there. items before us. I'll, I'll uh, leave it there, Chair. Thank Thanks. you. Good. Further speakers? Can, any further speakers? Lord Mayor. No further speakers. Thank you. Um, we now move to the vote on these items, which are effectively all in seriatim. So move to the vote on item A. All in favour of item A, the ENC report, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Item B, all in favour of item B, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division's been called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Please ring the bells, eyes to the right, nose to the left.
Thank you. Clarks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour and seven against. I declare that motion carried. Thank you. Please return to your seats. Quickly, please. Please, in silence. We now move to the vote on item C. Item C, all in favour of item C, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Three. Please ring the bells. Please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 22 in favour and two against. Thank you. Please everyone resume your seats. I'll declare that item carried. <laughs> Deputy Mayor, the Economic and Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympics and Paralympic Games Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Economic Development and Committee and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 3rd of May 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May 2022, be adopted. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. As always, our first committee presentation for the session is delivered by Chris Isles, uh, the Economic Development Manager, on the update of our economic activity over the last quarter. The focus for this one was on job growth and recovery in Brisbane, with the current data showing our unemployment rate is approaching record lows at 4.3 per cent, or around 30,000 unemployed, levels which have not been seen since 2003. I mean, it's a good sign that people are rejoining the workforce and businesses are taking on more staff. The number of jobs advertised is still hovering around 31,000 jobs at any one time, with little movement on that since the end of last year. So what this is, what we're actually seeing is dealing with a shortage of workers across all industries, not just hospitality and tourists, but expected and seen in larger professional services and managerial roles in Brisbane as well. What we're hearing from the industry through the Business Hub on our connections is that the mismatch of skills to jobs and the growing need for employment and training programs are desperately needed to combat these vacancies. And we're still seeing high migration rates with Greater Brisbane topping the list with the highest net internal migration to a capital city in Australia, most of which are coming from New South Wales and Victoria. The rate is comparable to the rest of Queensland, albeit, albeit slightly higher um, than Brisbane, as more people are choosing a scenic change. So we're seeing more of our tree changes and our sea changes, the Sunshine Coast, Harvey Bay and the sea, scenic rim. Our domestic travel through the airport is off to a strong start this year, but still a while off pre-COVID levels, sitting at around 50 per cent, while, of course, international travel still hasn't quite taken off with limited overseas flights at the moment. We are hoping to see these increase as uh, further easing of testing and vaccination requirements over the coming months and airlines putting on more flights as well. Our foot traffic in Queen Street Mall is on the rise, with pedestrian counters currently sitting at around the 65 per cent of pre-COVID levels, having recently hit a high point on the first week of Easter with 71 per cent over that period. 
with the city coming back online. As I mentioned in question time today, there is so much to see and do locally. We are hoping that we can encourage everybody to get out about and help that recovery. Um, as we were saying, what we are hearing from the corporates and businesses is that the skills that we need, the jobs for our growing employment, the training programs are really um, desperately needed to get uh, the the uh, people back into these vacancies. So, which is why I can report that the Brisbane Business Hub is well and truly back on track. It was there for a while as the business um, recovery hub uh, for the flood there with Maruka and Nunda as well. But they continue to provide their programs. Over the last week, we've seen email marketing automation masterclass. We've seen grow and activate customer communities on Facebook. If we can get businesses to grow, we can get more people into businesses as well. And some of the on the couches that we've had and the feedback has been absolutely fantastic. So um, Libby Trickett was one of our recent on the couches, um, which people were absolutely loving as well. And also a mental resilience mastery session with David Nair coaching. Um, the feedback was his coaching content was excellent. It was a great use of time for the business, and I know I will benefit greatly from applying for what I learnt. Um, coming up is Sharon Davies, Founder and Managing Director of Sales to Success. Um, very, very popular as well. So please, if you've got businesses that need support, send them to the business hub in town or over to the, the village one at Nunda Village, to the suburban business hub as well. We want to support them. And even people that are, are looking for businesses and up, uh, uh, upskilling themselves as well, the business hub is there for them as well. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the presentation. Um, just really wanted to drill down into this discussion about unemployment figures. It's, it's really interesting to me when the statistics were um, being presented with seemed so detached from the lived reality and material experiences of people. Um, because on the one hand, we're hearing from all levels of government that unemployment is really low, but on the other hand, on the street, I'm hearing from lots of people who are really struggling to find enough work and feel like it's, it's a really rough time to be looking for, for work. And uh, this was drawn out in some of the discussions during the presentation where our presenter acknowledged that for someone to count as being employed, they really only have to be employed for one hour a week. Um, and what I think we're seeing at the moment across the economy is widespread underemployment and a situation where Lots of people need more work and they're not getting enough hours or they're not getting enough shifts, but they're still being counted as employed. So governments and, and the council are telling us that, oh, things are good, unemployment's really low, there's lots of work available. Um, but in fact, people are having a really hard time getting enough hours, um, particularly in industries like hospitality and tourism and entertainment, but it seems like it's a, a, a wider problem. So. I'm, I'm not disputing that the overall statistic is correct, but it's just important to highlight that when we're counting how many people are actually employed by, according to this approach, um, we're counting someone who only has a few hours of week of work, uh, a few hours of work a week as being employed. And I don't think that's particularly good methodology. And I think we need to be looking at the unemployment rate alongside um, those underemployment stats as well, which paint a, a much more nuanced and very different picture. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Three. Any further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you. We now move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Owen, Transport Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of May 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Owen and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday 3 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week the committee was provided with an overview of Council's Network Coordination Centre, or as we affectionately refer to it as the NCC. As part of the Brisbane Metropolitan Traffic Management Centre, the NCC is the central hub for our public transport operations. Now, this is very important in our city because Council operates the, the centre from within our offices at Brisbane Square, and we run this centre in conjunction with the State Government's Transport and Main Roads Department to support our very, very busy busway network. As we all know, Brisbane City Council's buses are at the centre of the city's public transport, with two-thirds of public transport trips taken on buses. We all know 
that over the past couple of years, COVID has severely impacted patronage on our buses. And generally, on average, there are about 70 million bus trips in Brisbane every year. These trips are taken over 200 scheduled routes with another 200 district school bus routes also operated by our Brisbane City Council buses. Now, the NCC plays a vital role in delivering these services, helping to manage incidents on the road and busway network. From first service, to last service each day and sometimes 24 hours a day, the NCC acts as a constant support line for our wonderful bus drivers. And I do take this opportunity, Mr Chair, through you to acknowledge the work of all of our frontline bus drivers and all of our support personnel in Transport for Brisbane because they do an amazing job every single day. There is also a team on the ground who not only assist drivers in the field when incidents occur, but also help to manage our bus stop assets, install customer notifications, and also complete many route inspections. Support for our bus drivers covers everything from a flat battery to a full bus or a passenger emergency. And these situations can be very varied and the bus drivers go through a comprehensive training program to be able to identify these circumstances and the best way to communicate those through. Mr Chair, during the presentation at committee, we were told that in 2021 alone, over 162,000 calls were made and received between the operators and the NCC, showing just how important a resource it is for our bus drivers. On the technical side, every single bus is connected to the NCC via Tate radios. These ra radios were recently upgraded to improve the reliability and service coverage, especially in the CBD, where city buildings could sometimes interfere with the connection. This organisation-wide program transi transitioned our buses and ferries from older analogue radios to more reliable and newer digital radios. These new radios, the Tates, have been deployed for the London Bus Network, Queensland Rail, the Brisbane Airport Corporation, Tasmanian Railway and the Dublin Bus Network, just to name a few other similar transport organisations that they are operating within. In each bus, drivers have a radio receiver that categorises different calls in order to make it easier for the bus drivers to get the help that they need at the time that they need. The calls are received by the team in the NCC across seven consoles and are received by experienced team of network coordination officers. These officers are at the front line and help guide the driver through whatever scenario they may be facing. In most instances, calls are responded to in one minute or less which is very impressive considering the call volumes received every single day. All of the data and insights that are collected about each incident, no matter how small, also means that the NCC is constantly reviewing and improving the response process for the many different scenarios which may occur. I would also like to particularly thank the officers within the NCC for their work during the recent flood event. Over the weekend, when the floods first hit, roads were closing quickly and unexpectedly, and the NCC was at the centre of keeping our drivers and our many bus passengers safe out on the road. Widespread flooding and road closures, debris and damage to the road surface forced the suspension of some bus services as the severe weather set in. The heavy rain caused issues with the road network, as well as impacts to our bus depots and operator facilities, all of which affected our ability to deliver bus services for Brisbane residents. However, the connection to the NCC helped to ensure that drivers could report flooding or damage as and when it occurred, and also allowed the NCC to proactively report up-to-date information out to drivers as they were on their routes. Mr Chair, in Brisbane, it is common to hear the words, thank you driver, as you leave the bus. 
and we all know the wonderful work that our operators do in getting Brisbane commuters home sooner and safer. But this week's committee presentation gave us just a glimpse into the enormous effort that goes on behind the scenes to help keep our bus network running. I commend this report to the Chamber. Thank you. Further speakers? No further speakers. I now move the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. <coughs> Councillor Wines, Infrastructure Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting uh, held on the Tuesday, the 3rd of May 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Matic that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May 2022, be adopted. Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I just wanted to make some comments about the report that was presented to and the presentation made to the committee last week. It was on the topic of narrow street signage. So the council has been undertaking a trial. Uh, many councils would have experienced or been aware of concerns around uh, motor vehicles being parked uh, legally, but in narrow streets. And sometimes that uh, narrowness of the street limits motor vehicles being able to use those streets to travel through. Uh, this is a feature not only predictably of older suburbs or suburbs uh, cut and populated before motor vehicles, but it's also a feature of a whole range of suburbs uh, of different um, eras in our city. So we did this trial and there was two options presented to the public, uh, two types of signs, and uh, there was a, a consultation made with those uh, residents who lived nearby. An opportunity was there to vote electronically and allow information to pass through other means to determine which of the two they preferred. Now, one of the options was much preferred to the other. One said, um, one made it clear that you couldn't park on the other side, and the other one was, was probably closer to what it says in the MUTCD, but sometimes you need to be a little bit of an insider to understand what they're getting at. So the one that was more legible and clearer was preferred. Now, from the from the response, the overall positive community feedback was received and there was a reduction in customer complaints for the trial or in the trial area. 88% of feedback was positive and council has received requests for a further 48 new locations, including locations requested at last week's council, uh, committee meeting. Noting the success of the trial, we will continue with that and we'll look for new locations uh, for these information signs. Now they are information signs. But the trial has been determined to be a success and we are looking for further and future opportunities to be able to uh, improve the local traffic network in these narrow streets with this new device. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Strunk. There we go. Um, listen, um, I wanted to. I was quite interested in the presentation uh, last week in regards to the uh, the new so new temporary signage uh, that was uh, had been erected uh, in some uh, in some uh, wards. Um, it, it would be remiss of me not to uh, not to talk about this because uh, I probably uh, certainly I'm. Most of the new developments that actually happened around the city since Forest Lake was developed um, have had uh, a number of had very narrow streets down to five metres in some instances. Uh, I'm a bit lucky I live in, in one that's about seven metres wide. But we still have the same issue in regards to parking um, when two, car, two cars park parallel to one another. Uh, in the same street, in the same space, uh, or just across from one another. It's virtually, um, it's not impossible to get by them, but it's really, it's, you know, you're really threading a needle uh, for a lot of people, especially people driving big four-wheel drives and things like that, even though they're not supposed to be much wider, but they just seem to be. Um, so I was interested uh, in the signage, and I think they've picked the right sign uh, of the two uh, that were, uh, that were uh, designed. Um, but I think, for me, I think uh, they shouldn't really be temporary, they really should be permanent. 
which would then probably eliminate having to paint yellow lines everywhere. Um, it certainly, um, I, I would say, half of the streets just in the Forest Lake suburb alone would probably, uh, you, could, you could put up one of these signs. Um, uh, a lot of them are cul-de-sacs and things like that, so you may not uh, have to, uh, too much of that. But uh, anyways, I'd say probably half the streets uh, would, uh, would benefit from the, a permanent sign. So I, my recommendation is that we, we go beyond the uh, temporary six month, uh, three to six month uh, temporary ones to try to educate people and just make it permanent, uh, which would I think um, uh, give a, a better uh, long term, um, um, uh, better long term outcome uh, for, uh, for something that has really, really become part of the development uh, right across Brisbane. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Maddox. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just rise to speak in regards to this item. Um, a number of these um, locations are in the ward, and I certainly uh, welcomed the opportunity for this. Um, a lot of these streets are uh, pretty much glorified laneways, but um, and so over time, obviously, with um, number of homes, uh, number of families, and number of vehicles, um, the challenge has always been around. Uh, making sure that there is enough space for a car to pass by. So um, for a lot of people, uh, having this signage there uh, is a really effective way of just reminding them uh, not to park parallel to another vehicle that's already parked. And you can see that the result has been really positive. So I, um, I greatly welcome this and, uh, and the continued rollout of this program to uh, further alleviate um, those challenges for residents in their local streets. And as, as Councillor Strunk has rightly said, hopefully this will also minimise the request for the number of yellow lines that we constantly get, uh, that uh, ultimately it is about driver behaviour, and if people are made aware of it through signage like this, then we can get better outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Manning. Any further speakers? Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I just want to thank the contributions of uh, my colleagues in this uh, matter and just um, point out that uh, the points uh, that I made earlier that, that these narrow streets, while you might suspect they're more likely to be found in Paddington, which you would expect, they can be found in all the generations of development across the city. And can I just um, thank the meaningful con uh, contributions of all councillors and uh, I look forward to this program continuing to be able to make uh, our streets safer for motorists and pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the vote on this report, the Infrastructure Committee report. All in, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Allen, City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of May, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May, 2022, be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. In uh, the committee last week, we received a presentation from our development services manager on the new super yacht facility at the Rivergate Marina in Murray, which I believe is in uh, Councillor Atwood's ward. Uh, it's a very impressive facility indeed. The uh, $200 million expansion approved by Council over two development applications includes the construction of a $35 million state-of-the-art ship lift system with the capability of lifting vessels of up to 3,000 tonnes and 90 metres long, ten times the current capacity, a new hard stand space for maintenance and repairs, and additional refit sheds and berthing facilities to service up to 12 super yachts at one time with an estimated 60 additional super yachts each year. Um, this is really a, an excellent example of um, Brisbane being able to support a sophisticated industry. In addition to these facilities, there is a, um, uh, I guess, a centre that's called the Trade Centre. So we've got the servicing facilities and maintenance facilities as one DA, and then the second DA is a Trade Centre. Uh, for excellence. And this includes training rooms uh, aimed at the marine industry, it includes office facilities and it also includes crew accommodation and supporting food and beverage offerings. This project is unique in the fact that the accommodation for the crews and workers is provided on site with 14 units available to house crew members while their vessels are moored and undertaking repairs. 
that development was conditioned to limit the length of stays and is strictly only available for guests associated with the marine industry's activities. And this is an appealing facility for a, a super yacht service and maintenance operation because often when the uh, service activities are taking place, they need to quickly uh, refer to people who are familiar with the vessels and if they're on site, it makes that process a lot easier. I would also note that the facility has good access for the, the, the public, the, uh, the waterfront area is open. The uh, projects once completed will make Brisbane the largest super yacht hub in the Asia Pacific region, creating more than 2,000 new jobs for construction, marine and tourism industries, the majority of which will benefit local Brisbane businesses and close to $1 billion in wider economic benefits for Brisbane and Queensland. It's a big win for Brisbane, especially in the lead up to the 2032 Olympic and um, Paralympic Games. As we look to capitalise on growth and investment and capture a larger share of the tourism market. Both applications were approved in April and the project is essentially shovel ready. I look forward to seeing the completion of this world class facility and the many benefits it will bring to Brisbane and Queensland. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Further speakers? Mr Chair, uh, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Okay, thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the meeting adjourn for a period of 15 minutes uh, for an afternoon tea break that commences when the doors, uh, when councillors have vacated the chamber, the doors are shut. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. We're up to further speakers on city planning and suburban renewal. Any further speakers? No further speakers? Thank you. We can now move to the vote on this report. All in favour of the City Planning Suburban Renewal Committee report, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Davis, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 3rd of May 2022 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, last week, the committee received a detailed and historical presentation on Newstead Park and Newstead House. The park was the original farm setting for Newstead, ha uh, Newstead House, which was established in 1846 and was the first heritage property in Queensland to be protected by an Act of Parliament. It's also Brisbane's oldest surviving residence, being the home to some of Brisbane's most notable figures. And they include Patrick Leslie, who built the house and named the original cottage Newstead after Newstead Abbey in England. Captain John Clements Wickham, who was the first police magistrate and government resident for the Moreton Bay District. The Honourable Ratcliffe Pring, who was the first Attorney General in colonial Queensland. George Harris, who was a member of the Queensland Legislative Council and lived in the house for almost 20 years with his wife. And the Hislop family. Thomas Hislop was a member of the South Brisbane Council from 1888 to 1896, including Mayor from 1901 to 1903. Uh, Mr Chair, it was in 1918 that the City of Brisbane purchased Newstead House and Harry Moore, Brisbane Superintendent of Parks, moved into the house and began redesigning the gardens. His efforts culminated in the opening of Newstead Park in 1921 and, as we know today, Newstead Park is one of Brisbane's key inner city park spaces. From 1934, the house was leased to the Royal Historical Society of Queensland to be used as a museum and research library. But when the Second World War broke, the American Armed Forces took over the house and occupied it from 1942 until early 1946. During this time, the park contained a gun emplacement near the bandstand, raid slip trenches and a concrete air raid shelter. In 1951, the Australian American Association erected the first American War Memorial in Australia at Newstead Park. And I know you have a very strong interest in that, Mr Chair. And it represented the military significance both of both the house and the park uh, and the role that they played during the time that the Americans uh, were stationed there. Further plaques were added to the memorial in 1988 and 1995. 
Another feature of the park is the Newstead Tram substation, number five, which was designed by council architect and construction engineer Roy Rosden Ogg and opened in 1928. It was one of 10 substations built to supply power from New Farm Powerhouse Station to Brisbane's electric tram network. In 1969, it became redundant with the discontinuation of the Brisbane tramway system uh, in and in 1977 was transferred to the Newstead House Board uh, of Trustees and converted to a resource centre. Mr Chair, it's important to protect, conserve and invest in places that play an important role in creating community identity and contribute to our local cultural heritage. There are four related projects uh, in the park precinct and they include Newstead House Conservation Project, which is a joint restoration and conservation project to protect and uh, uh, present Newstead House as it was in the late 1800s. Uh, the temporary works depot relocation, toilet box uh, replacement uh, and the Breakfast Creek Greenbridge, which will link the Laura's Bonnie River Walk along Kingsford Smith Drive to Newstead Park and it will maximise the accessibility, activation and connectivity to both the park and the house. Um, item B uh, is a petition. Uh, the committee received a petition with eight signatures requesting that council name the Wynnum Manly District Meals on Wheels facility at 880 Manly Road, Wakeley as the Ken Edwards Centre. And the committee supported the recommendation that council consider the naming in accordance with our naming parks, facilities and tracks procedure. And I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Thank you. Further speakers? Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr Chair. I refer to item B, the uh, petition, requesting council name the Meals on Wheels facility at 880 Manly Road, Wakerley as the Ken Edwards Centre. I uh, am very uh, strongly supportive of this. Uh, uh, Ken uh, worked in the post office. He, he retired early and then he de devoted himself to community life. He's been Meals on Wheels president for uh, several decades, would be the closest I could come to it. He was state president of Meals on Wheels for a while. Uh, only, only just recently, only in the last week or so, has uh, received information to indicate that Ken would be resigning from the, as president of Meals on Wheels due to ill health. He's uh, living now up in the Sunshine Coast hinterland with one of his daughters. But he's uh, done a tremendous amount of work and of course his greatest claim to fame is the efforts he put in to get the, uh, the Meals on Wheels uh, centre built on, uh, on Manly Road. Uh, he worked hard to get land donated to the, to the Meals on Wheels from the Marching Girls Association. Uh, and in fact, uh, the uh, president of the Marching Girls Association, who was part of that process, had the park in front of the Meals on Wheels named after him uh, about a year ago, uh, Bill McFarlane. Uh, then uh, Ken, a bit of a wheeler and dealer, he managed to get a, a hundred grand donation out of the local developer BMD towards the project. Uh, he got uh, several million dollars from the Brisbane City Council. Council provided services to the site, and then uh, at the end, when they, uh, they actually, I think, it might have been the, BM, the uh, sorry, the Meals on Wheels money had run out. The uh, council stumped up for further substantial amount of money to uh, finish off the freezer room. That was the final part of the project. So it's a uh, state-of-the-art Meals on Wheels facility. I, you know, I haven't been around Queensland, but I'd say it, it would be up there with anything in Queensland. The, uh, pro the, the Meals on Wheels facility is, uh, is going very well, delivering high quality meals. I, I actually deliver them myself with the local Rotary team and uh, they do a great job. Uh, it's a very competitive environment these days. Uh, other, there's competitors for Meals on Wheels uh, who also can get the, uh, uh, the, the, the subsidy that is received from government. But they also, of course, you can these days, frozen meals are very commonly available from supermarkets, so it does make it tough, but uh, there's still plenty of demand for Meals on Wheels. Uh, Ken will be a very worthy person to have the kitchen named after him for all his efforts over the years. And I should mention passing that Ken's daughter, Shirley, is a very hard-working, long-term BCC employee who is uh, very proud of her dad, and rightfully so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. Any further speakers? Councillor Davis? <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Cumming, for speaking about Ken and listening to you. I think I've actually had the great opportunity to meet Ken when I was serving in another role, and I agree. I don't know that he's a wheeler and dealer. I didn't see that side of him. Uh, but I certainly saw that this was a gentleman very passionate about Meals on Wheels and making sure that those uh, more vulnerable people in our community were well served. So thank you very much, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We now move to the vote on this report, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Marks, City Standards Committee report, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 3rd of May 2022 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Marks and seconded by Councillor Toomey that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting dated Tuesday 3 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, we had a committee presentation on the asphalt production, maintenance and innovation. Um, it was quite an interesting presentation because I had uh, done a site visit out to Riverview to the asphalt plant there to, to just have a look around and see what's going on and what we do in that space. And I noticed this really large, round, drum-like thing on the ground and I asked about it and they said that was a new drum that was due to be replaced the old one in the uh, Riverview um, plant. Um, it, it was something that happens, you know, over an, a, a number of years. So I said to them, well, Pat, that would be a really cool um, committee presentation. And if they could take a time lapse video of the replacement as well, that would be really good. So it was fortuitous to have a visit out there at that time um, and to be able to then bring that to the committee is just one of the things that we do um, as far as council goes. There was two petitions requesting council um, to do with some maintenance on a medium strip out at Orderly. Um, this was another one where I had a site visit with a local councillor. Um, it was it's one of those really difficult sites, like what I call the high-low roads. Um, a number of councillors have them in their wards. I don't have any, but I know there's quite a few people across the city do. Um, they are particularly difficult to manage, um, and what we've asked officers to do is to come back to us and see if they can come up with some sort of um, a good solution on how to deal with these high-low road um, maintenance things that officers um, can manage to maintain at a reasonable um, level of safety and obviously cost effective as well. Um, and then there was a petition about council removing trees in Holland Park, um, some of which were removed, the rest were um, um, maintained and pruned. Um, I'm happy to leave the debate to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers on the City Standards Report? No? I now move the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Um, I understand we have joining us in the public gallery uh, Mayor Andy Ireland, Councillor Nigel Hutton and Councillor Glenda Mather from the Livingston Shire Council. Welcome. Thank you for, for joining us uh, for this afternoon's meeting here in Brisbane. Um, now, Councillor Howard, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of May 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May 2022, be adopted. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Now, I know it's been a little while since I've updated the Chamber on all of the fantastic things that happen in and around Brisbane. Um, on this occasion, not necessarily all at night time, but um, I think that it is worthy um, just to mention a few of the things that uh, have started to uh, happen uh, in and around the city. Of course, there's more to see and do, and it, it's fantastic after not only um, COVID, but the flood, the, the flood events also to see that we are slowly coming back to life. So this morning I had uh, the pleasure of going along to Regional Flavours. Our Deputy Mayor has already talked about Regional Flavours and it was fantastic to see, I think that they're called um, people who um, help you get the word out about what's happening and there were lots of them taking photos. We had a couple of chefs, we had a couple of TV cameras and it's fantastic. So that's happening this weekend from the 13th to the 15th of May and I really encourage, in the past we've had 40,000 people attend this event at South Bank and it really is something that I encourage all councillors to encourage their, um, their residents to come along to because uh, many of the events are free. There are some ticketed, but uh, it would be a great opportunity to support not only um, some of our local chefs, but also um, the local producers uh, in and around southeast uh, Queensland. 
Um, I also had the great pleasure of attending the Tenerife Festival launch, and that will be held this year on the 28th of May. Now, many of you will be saying, hang on, it doesn't seem that long since we had the last one, and it's not, uh, because uh, what they're trying to do is to have their annual Tenerife Festival launch, uh, their Tenerife Festival now on the 28th of May, so the last weekend in May, uh, to allow more people to, to attend. So, um, again, that's uh, another great opportunity for people to get along and see a local festival that is really uh, become iconic across Brisbane. So, uh, and speaking of iconic festivals, and the Lord Mayor mentioned this one, um, the Anywhere Festival was also launched this week, which will go for most of this month. And again, anywhere, everywhere, and so important to support our local artists, our local creatives. Um, it was a great event. Uh, it certainly, we had a little bit of a taste of some of the performances that would be happening. And again, that was um, a great opportunity for us to support local, um, local, local um, talent. Um, on Friday, we had the Croquet Association Queensland 100 Year Celebration Civic Reception. And I know that there were a number of councillors, I think Councillor Landis was there, I know that uh, um, Councillor Cumming, I think you were there, and also um, Councillor um, from Tennyson was there. So it was fantastic to see so many people um, there to support the Croquet Association celebrate their 100 year um, with, within, within Croquet, so a, a great opportunity. Um, on Saturday night, I went along to the Women in Brass concert. And you've got to say that very carefully, but the Women in Brass concert um, was run by Marissa Clark, and it was held at the Old Museum Concert Hall. And can I just say, it was the most fantastic evening to see these women assembled from the different bands around Brisbane uh, to entertain us. And it was a, 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 fantastic, um, a fantastic evening of, of bringing those, that talent together. Um, Sunday, of course, was Mother's Day, so I want to thank Councillor Davis for providing um, the Mother's Day in, on the green, Mother's Day on the green at Victoria Park, on my side of the Victoria Park. Thank you very much. Um, it was a bit overcast. We weren't sure that we were going to be able uh, to have this, but it was fantastic. We had local families sitting out on picnic baskets and being entertained again by local artists, so uh, another opportunity. It was also um, the end of the... Um, the Brisbane Writers' Festival, and I really want to give a big shout out to Sarah Runsey um, and her team for the fantastic effort that they've made this year for uh, the Brisbane Writers' Festival. And the last event was um, held at Customs House, and it was um, a high tea that was completely sold out, and it was the, uh, those two girls interviewing Sally Hepworth. So, again, Fantastic local um, for the for the people. Well, Sally's not local; she's from Melbourne, but we brought her. She, she came up anyway. But can I just say that it was fantastic to see the Brisbane Writers Festival doing so well and really supporting again um, some of our local writers. Um, and then finally, I went along to the Masonic Centre on Sunday evening for four seasons of Vivaldi that uh, we had the Sinfonia of St Andrews and a soloist uh, who was quite amazing, Robert Smith. And again, this was an opportunity for uh, the, the Masonic um, Grand Masonic Hall to, um, to help with some fundraising for Headspace. And uh, it's, as, as many of you might know, it's a beautiful, beautiful building and it was a fantastic afternoon and all for a good cause. So that's uh, some of the things that have been happening around Brisbane and I, and, and I hazard a guess that there's been a whole lot more than that, but that's, they're the ones that I got along to. So uh, moving to the report, last week, week we had a committee presentation on the contact centre beyond a call. And of course, we, uh, we had the wonderful manager of customer services who's now taken himself off to Redlands, but uh, it, was, uh, a, a great, um, it was a great way for Shane to say farewell to us. It was a, a, a great presentation. Um, and one of the things, of course, that we always celebrate is the fact that the contact centre has a 94% customer satisfaction score. And that is really um, 
a great, um, a great sort of uh, compliment, not only to Shane, but the entire team and all of the people who work in the contact centre. And I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in this chamber when I say that uh, we are constantly having um, compliments provided to us about the contact centre and how it operates. So thank you to each and every one of you. And one of the things that Shane mentioned, which um, I took on board, was he says that they strive for outstanding service. And he says that outstanding means much better than usual. So I think that we can all say that uh, every, each and every one of our um, officers within the contact centre is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Any further speakers? No further speakers. Now move to the report on this committee report. Uh, to, sorry, to the vote on this committee report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cunningham, the Finance and Committee Governance Report, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of May, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Cunningham and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 3 May, 2022, be adopted. Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. Just before I get to the report, I wanted to update the Chamber on the latest information from our City Resilience Branch on the current weather. Council has been in regular contact with the Bureau of Meteorology, most recently this afternoon. The latest advice from BOM for the Brisbane local government area is that Brisbane will experience persistent showers from today through to Friday, with peak days being tomorrow, Wednesday and Friday. Rain is expected to come in from the northwest from tomorrow. Rainfall should start to increase tomorrow morning and is expected to be slow and steady over the next three days. However, BOM has advised it's unlikely the Brisbane local government area will see gusty or damaging winds. Also importantly, they've advised this afternoon that they will not be issuing a flood watch for the Brisbane River. To the report now, Mr Chair, our presentation and first committee report was the net borrowings report, which included an economic update from the corporate treasurer. At the corporate treasurer's last presentation in February, things were looking more positive for the global economy and moving back towards pre-pandemic GDP trajectory. Since then, though, of course, the war in Ukraine has had a dramatic impact on the global economy. Of course, inflation is still a major concern globally and here at home. We also had the bank and investment report for February with the CFO on hand to answer any questions of the committee and I'll leave the rest to the chamber. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to um, speak on this item and I'll, I'll just make a few minor reports. Now, um, this, uh, I've been here 14 years. This comes through every week, um, uh, sorry, every month, uh, with details of Council's everyday expenditure. And I know Councillor Shrunk uh, follows this through. Um, <clears throat> uh, however, I, I think it's drawing a very long bow to be uh, talking about how the war in Ukraine is impacting on the city of uh, Brisbane's finances. And uh, uh, if there was any really quantifiable measures in there uh, along these lines, I, I, it, it would be very good to know because uh, I think it's a bit of a reach. However, um, the one thing that isn't coming from this finance chairperson, the person responsible for disaster management in this city, is anything to do with how disaster management is being handled. Um, we know, for example, um, that there are major changes to the budget that are happening uh, because um, the Lord Mayor stuffed up his Olympics buyback uh, and he factored in $200 million to buy back a property in West End uh, that he couldn't do and then the state had to buy it back. Um, so there's $200 million sitting in the budget that we don't know what they're going to use it for. It'll just disappear into the ether. Um, we know that flood recovery is costing this council money, but we don't know where that money's coming from. We don't know how it's being funded. We don't know what if any projects are being cut. I know projects in my ward have been delayed. They're just not happening. Are we seeing anything useful from the finance chairman about the state of the finances in Brisbane? No, we are not. But I'm so helpful she could share with us how the war in Ukraine is impacting on Brisbane's uh, finances. Very insightful. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you. We now move to the vote on this report, uh, the Finance and City Governance Committee report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes 
have it. Councillors, the next item on the agenda, item six, is consideration of the notified motion sub submitted by Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Councillor Cook, would you like to read your motion? Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that Brisbane City Council creates a new homelessness strategy for the City of Brisbane. Thank you. Seconded. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. The housing crisis, homelessness and cost of living are some of the biggest challenges facing our city today. This motion is the opportunity for all councillors in this place to publicly support the creation of a new homelessness strategy for the city that will ensure that Brisbane City Council has a coordinated, targeted and measurable strategy to support some of the most vulnerable in our community. I cannot think of a more pressing issue for this council to address than homelessness. It's a complex problem with complex causes. It reflects poverty, inequality and a growing housing affordability crisis in our city. Despite Australia's prosperous economy, almost a million Australians are living in housing stress. And like other cities around the world, our local community faces a homelessness crisis. Becoming homeless is a devastating experience that can happen to anyone. At its most acute, it means having to sleep rough on the streets or live in unsafe housing. Brisbane's housing affordability crisis has been driven by high private rental prices, the lack of affordable housing, residential properties being left vacant and inadequate social housing. The 2016 census reported over 116,000 people who were homeless in Australia. 5,813 of those were in the city of Brisbane. The census figures include people living in improvised dwellings, tents or sleeping out, in supported accommodation for the homeless, staying temporarily with other households, living in boarding houses or other temporary lodging, or living in severely crowded dwellings. Providing access to safe, affordable and secure housing and services for those who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless is critical to ensuring that Brisbane's economic growth as a city is inclusive and delivers opportunities for all. It is time for Brisbane City Council to develop a new homelessness strategy that includes key actions to reduce homelessness and its impacts in Brisbane by closely working with community members, services and other agencies. We are the largest council in Australia with a $3.6 billion budget and we should be leading the way when it comes to social issues like homelessness. It is critical to remember as part of this debate that we will have today that people do not choose to become homeless. Often homelessness is a culmination of a lack of housing and accumulated experiences of disadvantage. Its causes are complex and involve a number of interacting factors that play out in different ways from person to person. Someone's pathway to, into homelessness is impacted by a number of structural drivers, risk factors and protective factors. Structural drivers include housing affordability, labour market forces, reliance on income support and intergenerational poverty. Risk factors include unemployment, financial stress, family breakdown, domestic and family violence, trauma, mental health issues, drug or alcohol dependence and a history of contact with state services. Some of the protective factors include employment, financial security, involvement in school or community, healthy family relationships and access to and integration of services. These factors can all affect a person's risk of homelessness and their resilience if it occurs. Homelessness can affect people of all ages from any section of the community. While for some it may be a temporary situation, for others it can last many, many years or even a lifetime. When most people think um, of someone being homeless, they think of someone sleeping rough on the streets. I think we have all witnessed this, particularly in the inner city, and anecdotally there appears to be a large number of young people um, in the inner city who may not be captured by official data channels. In Australia, rough sleepers only represent actually about 7% of all people who are homeless. A person who is homeless may not necessarily be living on the streets. While not as visible, there are an increasing number of people who are experiencing secondary or tertiary homelessness. They may be living in temporary accommodation, such as refuges or staying in accommodation that falls below minimum community standards, such as some of our older boarding houses or overcrowded homes. The common factor for people who may be homeless is their lack of access to stable, secure and affordable housing, leading to much poorer outcomes in life. 
Mr Chair, homelessness is a complex issue with no single set of causes and no single solution. However, homelessness and its impacts could be dramatically reduced in Brisbane with commitment and leadership from all levels of government, and it is timely for Brisbane City Council to now formalise its commitment through a publicly available, comprehensive homelessness strategy. We have already seen the benefits in our city of a domestic violence strategy, which was initiated by Labor three years ago and formally adopted by this chamber two years ago. At the time that strategy was considered by this chamber, I discussed the benefits of a homelessness strategy to complement the existing domestic violence strategy. <coughs> this morning, I asked the Lord Mayor uh, a question in question time about um, his intentions in terms of reviewing and progressing that strategy. This would also be a timely thing to do if there is consideration today of a new homelessness strategy for the city. I hope that a homelessness strategy for the city of Brisbane uh, will receive bipartisan support from this chamber this afternoon, and it could also incorporate a commitment to working collaboratively with both the state and federal governments, non-government services and the community. A new strategy for our city could see a continuing of investment in and advocacy for services and supports to reduce homelessness, like Homeless Connect. A continuation and expansion of the Pathways Out of Homelessness grants, which are due to come to an end this financial year, but which has seen 11 community organisations funded to provide new and innovative solutions to create collaborative and sustainable pathways out of homelessness. Those grants have had a particular focus on women and children escaping domestic and family violence, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, single men and women experiencing homelessness, women over 55, young people aged 12 to 25 years, and families <coughs> impacted by homelessness. Also, a priority could be service coordination at a street level. This could include greater support and funding for mobile voluntary services that operate in our city like Bed Down, Orange Sky Laundry, Rosies and Four Voices. At a strategic level, advocating for policy changes and contributing to funding to increase social and affordable housing in Brisbane is another opportunity for a homelessness strategy. It could also include council piloting a tiny homes program like Noosa City Council achieved in 2021, and of course, seeing a continuation and expansion of the Community Housing Partnership Project and for the Brisbane Housing Company, which would be critical parts of any new strategy. Nationally, there are some excellent examples from the City of Sydney, City of Melbourne, as to the development and implementation of a homelessness strategy. Other cities, like Adelaide, are currently drafting a homelessness and housing affordability strategy, and the Gold Coast are developing a homelessness action plan. It is well and truly time for Brisbane City Council to develop a new homelessness strategy for our city. We have an obligation to ensure that we do all we can to help those most in need in our city. We need to ensure our residents are safe and have secure housing. People are what makes a city. We must do all we can as a city to support them. A homelessness strategy is the first step in that process, and I hope all councillors in this place support the motion today. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor. Will Councillor Cook take a quick question? Can we wait till the end? <laughs> Not right now. Later? Okay. Thank you. Further speakers? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Landers. I rise to speak, speak on this motion. Housing and homelessness is a very topical subject at the moment, with the vacancy rate in Brisbane being just 1%. Low interest rates, as well as the interstate migration our state has seen, has been a perfect storm to create this situation. While there are signs of this cooling off, it, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be addressed. And that's why it was so encouraging to recently see the Queensland Government release their Housing and Homelessness Action Plan 2021-25. Having read the document, it is a very comprehensive way of addressing not only housing, but homelessness in this state. From the outset, the government is clear that they have established a coordinated housing and homelessness response across nine priority locations, which includes Brisbane. Additionally, the strategy commits $12.5 million to fund 162 projects under the Dignity First Fund. This is to support new innovative ideas that prevent and reduce homelessness and help people experiencing homelessness to live with dignity. On top of this, the strategy talks about the recently commenced 
build to rent projects underway in both Newstead and the Valley. Brisbane City Council was very supportive of these projects and facilitated the development approval for these 750 apartments, of which up to 240 dwellings will be provided as affordable housing. The state has a clear and strong responsibility for its capital city, and we are happy to see five key action items under the heading towards ending homelessness. The actions recognise that responding to housing Responding to housing needs and moving towards ending homelessness means supporting each other to work together to improve outcomes for individuals and the community as a whole. Mr Chair, the outcome of this motion was that the City of Brisbane have in place a strategy to deal with homelessness. With this in mind, I propose the following amendment. Remove the words creates a new homelessness strategy for the City of Brisbane and add the words notes that notes the state government's recently created Housing and Homelessness Action Plan for Queensland, which includes the City of Brisbane. So the new motion proposed is as follows. That Brisbane City Council notes the state government's recently created Housing and Homelessness Action Plan for Queensland, Point which order, includes Mr. the Chairman. City of Brisbane. Point of order. Yeah, uh, Mr Chairman, um, well, I'm sorry, I've been given the call, Councillor Adams. Um, yeah, but I've been given the call, Councillor Adams, but thank you so much. Uh, uh, the motion or the amendment to the motion that's being proposed is fundamentally and substantially not even, not even a minor. It's, it's saying it's getting rid of creating a homelessness strategy at Council and Cam saying we should follow something by the State Government. Councillor now, the amendment under the meeting's local law must be um, in line with the uh, motion that's moved. This clearly and fundamentally changes it to something completely different and should be ruled out of order, Mr Chair. Thank you for your opinion, Councillor Johnston. I've just been received a copy of the proposed amendment. Uh, and it reads or asks that um, the, in the motion the removal of the words creates a new homeless, homelessness strategy for the city of Brisbane. Add the words notes the state government's recently created housing and homelessness action plan for Queensland, which includes the city of Brisbane. So the amended motion would read that Brisbane City Council notes the state government's recently created housing and homelessness action plan for Queensland, which includes the city of Brisbane. Um, in my view, it is consistent with the original motion, which is for, that there is a homelessness strategy for the city of Brisbane, and, and this would be under the auspice of the state government's policy. No, no point, point of order. order yeah. point, point of order, no. Councillor Cassidy. Um, the, the motion is actually very clear that for the city of Brisbane. Uh, the city of Brisbane had a homelessness strategy, um, as Councillor Cook outlined, and this motion is calling on council to create a new homelessness strategy for the city of Brisbane. Uh, so what councillor, what councillor Lander's amendment here does uh, is talk about a state government policy, not a Brisbane City Council policy, which is the intent of this motion. So I'd ask you to seek a, a, um, a, a short adjournment um, to get some advice from, um, from City Legal about this one, because this really fundamentally changes the intent of this motion. If the, they could argue all they want, Chair, uh, that side of the chamber, if they don't like what, what we have put up here, they can, they can make their arguments and vote against it if they don't believe that the City of Brisbane should have a homelessness strategy. But you can't just go and change the intent of this motion to note that the state government has a separate has a separate policy to the city of Brisbane, and so I think you need to get some the legal advice, Chair. Councillor Councillor Cassidy, the intent of the motion is to for the city of Brisbane to have a homelessness action point plan. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry, I'm just dealing with the first point of order. Can you please sit while I'm talking? Does my sitting require you to? To, yes, you're not it able does. To it talk. does. While I'm, right. while I'm talking, okay. it does. Thank you. Uh, in, in my opinion, this does not change the intent of the original motion. Point, oh, sorry, point, point, of order. point of order. Point, point of, order. of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Now, Mr Chairman, I just draw to your attention that you are required to abide by the meeting's local law. The meeting's local law require you to not allow amendments that do not substantially reflect the original motion. Um, that uh, you're doing this without seeking any advice 
um, means very clearly in this case um, that you are making a personal decision to ignore the meeting's local law and to allow the LNP to move a motion that has zero to do with the original motion that was moved. I urge you, Mr Chairman, to seek legal advice. Um, because I can tell you now I will not be letting this go if you refuse um, to even seek advice about this and continue as you are. Thank you, councillors. Uh, I will take an amendment. I will seek an amendment to take further advice on this matter. Counc uh, Deputy Mayor, would you move a motion for an amendment for a uh, adjournment, please? Uh, Mr Chair, at your request, I move that we amend for you to receive legal advice on the amendment that's been presented. Thank, thank to adjourn, you. sorry. To adjourn. Too many A words. To thank adjourn you. for you to All seek legal advice. All in favour of an adjournment to allow me to yes. seek uh, further advice, please Second. say aye. aye. Oh, sorry. Is there a seconder to the motion? There was. Councillor Landers stood to put a hand up. Um, it was seconded by Councillor Landers. All in favour, please say aye. Any aye. post, please say no. The ayes have it. We'll have an adjournment for 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you, councillors. I've taken advice um, and agree that the intent of the amended amendment is inconsistent with the intent of the original motion. Uh, we didn't get to a, a vote on that amendment. Um, I, so I'm ruling on the point of order that was moved in relation to the proposed amendment. Um, therefore, Councillor Landers, you have the floor on debate on the original motion. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, I just wanted to um, add to the debate by referring to the state's plan uh, on page 14, where it outlines some of the steps towards ending homelessness. If I can just read them out, the five points that I referred to earlier. Uh, 6.1 is co-design homelessness and housing service system and practice improvements with service users and sex sector experts. 6.2, better integrate service delivery across government and community services, including through joint assessment, pathway planning, referral protocols and information sharing. 6.3, house people who are in crisis and tra transition them to longer-term housing with on-site or mobile support. 6.4, enhance the coordinated housing and homelessness response in priority locations across the state to identify people experiencing homelessness and coordinate services for people with complex housing and support needs. And 6.5, equip the government and community sector workforce to develop the skills, practice and tools needed to deliver person-centred, coordinated outcomes, focused housing with support services. So therefore, we, we are all committed to preventing homelessness and supporting vulnerable people in our communities. But I do believe the way to tackle this is with a unified and focused approach through the state and housing ministers recently compiled Action Plan 2021 to 2025. Therefore, um, I would like to add the words to the amendment so that it now reads, that Brisbane City Council creates a new homelessness strategy for the City of Brisbane that is consistent with the State Government's recently created Housing and Homelessness Action Plan for Queensland as it relates to councils. Seconded. Seconded. Okay. Now, so we have an, an amendment to the motion. Um, have you circulated that, or can you circulate the words? Um, but I got it as. Oh, here's a copy for me. Thank you. That after the words in the original motion for the city of Brisbane adds the words that is consistent with the state government's recently created housing and homelessness action plan for Queensland as it relates to councils. Councillor Landers to the amendment. Further debate on the amendment? I'll talk to it. Councillor Johnston. Yeah, I think she just had the one speech. Um, 
I would just like to um, double check, if it's all right with you, Mr Chairman, um, that the amendment that we are uh, voting on now, which will appear in the council minutes, is the top portion of this piece of paper uh, that, consistent with the state government's recently created housing and homelessness action plan for Queensland as it relates to councils. That's actually the amendment. Oh, my understanding is that the amendment is the as it will as is the words below the motion will now read well see that's what happens if the amendment is accepted but we're asked at the moment to because i've just noticed in the last couple of weeks in the minutes as well um, that these amended motions are appearing where it says that there is an amendment so the amended motion isn't um, adopted until after we discuss and debate the amendment. Fair enough. So I'd just like to check as a matter of record that that is the amendment because I will check the minutes again this week. I've, I've noticed that the last couple of weeks, I queried it a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, so I'm speaking to the amendment, which is the top section. Um, I just want to stand up, uh, sorry, I'd just like to say um, that I commend Councillor Cook uh, and the Labor Party for bringing through um, the uh, motion before us today, um, and it just says volumes, I think, that um, all the Liberal Party have to offer this debate was to try and stop Council talking about developing a homelessness strategy, and even now, when they know that they can't do it, um, they're still trying to amend the motion uh, uh, to um, imply that this is a state government responsibility. I don't know that Councillor Landers actually heard what she was saying, which is that all levels of government have a responsibility here, that we all have to contribute to homelessness um, strategies and solutions. Um, it is fascinating to me that neither the planning chairperson uh, nor the um, communities and lifestyle chairperson nor the Lord Mayor, um, they didn't stand up to move amendments. Um, it's the whip who's standing up to move an amendment. Uh, I find it staggering that when, um, when uh, motions are brought up um, by others in this place, the LNP's response to it is to send out a backbencher to try and stop it, and then when they can't stop it, to try and change it so it fundamentally does not um, reflect the intent of the original motion. We're not having a substantive debate about homelessness. Um, Councillor Landers has just stood up and read out some sections of a state government report. Now, I listened to what Councillor Cook said, and there are a lot of issues um, within that that I strongly support. And uh, I think uh, it's a very good idea to be talking about homelessness, um, not just uh, as a result of ongoing issues within Brisbane around cost of housing pressures, but also in the context of disaster recovery and the catastrophic impact that's had on um, uh, housing for people affected by the floods. Uh, but I want to put on the record uh, a few things that I think would be worthwhile as part of this strategy. I think this is a very good motion, uh, and I, I certainly don't see the need to add the amendment that's been put forward uh, here before us today. Um, but I just want to put on the record a few things that I do support. Um, one, the Anley Baptist Church has been the recipient of one of the um, uh, grants that Councillor Cook referred to earlier, and that funding finishes this year. Their homelessness and belonging project is going to be defunded if there is not more funding that comes forward from this government. They do provide tiny houses, Councillor Cook, you will be happy to know in Annerley, um, and it's making a real difference on a temporary basis to people in extremely vulnerable circumstances. Um, they're provided with um, housing support, with food, um, with support to fill out paperwork that they need for employment and, and immigration and all those kind of things. And it's a brilliantly run project um, that's being delivered uh, with uh, Community Plus, the Yoronga Community Centre and the Anley Baptist Church. And I was very pleased to launch it and Councillor Griffiths was there with me um, when we launched it a couple of years ago. Um, I, I certainly think the um, administration needs to continue uh, uh, grant funding for, uh, for projects like this uh, that are innovative, um, that can deliver on, uh, you know, providing relief for homelessness that, that government's not good at doing, because the community sector has a very active role uh, to play here. 
Secondly, we should be more we should be working more with community housing providers. Sherwood Neighbourhood Centre provides emergency housing in my ward and they do a marvellous job. Um, the only government support they get from council is a little bit of rates rebate. That's it. Um, and these people are providing emergency housing for people fleeing domestic violence, um, uh, refugees, um, you know, a whole range of people. It's an extraordinary service they provide in my community, and our council basically does nothing to help them behind the scenes. So I definitely would like to see uh, council support the community sector uh, in uh, greater uh, in greater numbers. I'd also like to see us having uh, more of a discussion um, about the Brisbane Housing Corporation's role in providing affordable and social housing. This is something I've mentioned um, several times in this place. Um, I think that they are a vehicle that's been set up uh, by the state government and council, and I don't think we're using them in the way that um, we could uh, to deliver on greater housing uh, outcomes in both the affordable and social housing spaces. Um, whether there are market mechanisms that we should be looking at as well, I think there should be. Um, I'm sure Councillor Shri will speak to some of this. I know he's done so over many years in this place. Um, but there are market mechanisms to ensure that um, the available accommodation that's out there is actually being used. Um, and it might not be an issue at the moment, but it has been in the past. So I guess um, for me, uh, I don't understand why the LNP feel like they've got to um, take something that's a pretty straightforward um, motion, which is that we develop a houses, housing, house, homelessness housing strategy. Um, and I don't see why the whip has got to stand up and try and say, well, no, we shouldn't be doing it. We can only do it if Big Brother, the state government, says it's OK. I mean, this, this council stands up and criticises the state government every second day of the week. Um, and I, I don't understand why we can't have a, a, a rational debate about our council having a policy um, to talk about strategies that our city can do to help deal with homelessness. It's, it's the LNP that cut the homelessness, um, uh, the city hall event. Um, they used to be two a year. That's back to one a year. Um, it, it's just... There's not a lot of focus on this. Um, I appreciate Councillor Shri. It's a major issue for him, and I know that he'll speak about this um, at some point as well. I appreciate that Labor are bringing forward a policy initiative, and it's just disappointing to see that the LNP's response to a genuine initiative um, that is needed within the city is to try and stop it and then send the whip out to spike it. And I just don't think that's necessary. Um, this is a big, mature council, and having a debate about having a homelessness policy, I think, is a good thing. Thank you. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I just want to... To the amendment. Yeah, yeah, the amendment, yeah. yeah. No, I, I just want to get this straight. The, the LNP had 24 hours to, to yes. think about this motion that Councillor Cook and I brought forward to, to formulate a position on that. Yeah. Uh, and, and their position was to say no. Uh, we, the LNP's position in this place is their first and foremost position in Council is to have no homelessness strategy. Yes. That's their first and foremost position. And then we have this adjournment uh, to see whether that is in fact a competent amendment, uh, and it's not. And so then they use, they use that adjournment that was supposed to be seeking legal advice to come up with, with using council's city legal office to come up with an amendment that, that wouldn't substantially uh, change, wouldn't substantially change the original um, motion, which is really simple. It's a really simple proposition about the values of this council uh, and about what kind of political party in council do you want to be? Do you want to be, do you want to be an administration uh, that actually cares about addressing these fundamental issues of homelessness in our city? Or do you want to be a political party over there that quietly removes uh, the original homelessness strategy from council's website and slowly winds back all of the support the council used to have uh, here in Brisbane for homelessness. <clears throat> you know, it was a Labor administration that worked with a Labor state government to set up the Brisbane Housing Company. Uh, it was a Labor administration that brought in the homelessness strategy that we did have. 
and built around that strategy a whole lot of resources uh, and practical things the council could do as a council to support the work of other levels of government, uh, because we are the level of government, of course, that is most in touch with the community. Uh, but what we see here today in the original amendment, and now that this amendment uh, is here that the LNP have had to back down on, uh, is, is a real true statement of values. It's Labor that has brought this policy to the Council, and it's the LNP uh, that is trying to, trying to use mechanisms and rules of Council to shut down debate uh, and to essentially say they don't want to have a homelessness strategy in Brisbane. Without being upfront about it, that's right. Um, so, so this approach is really disappointing um, from the LNP, and we know this is what they're all about at the moment, because the Lord Mayor, who is not here, who won't contribute to this debate about this fundamental issue, if it's not about the Olympics and talk about the Metro Bendy bus project, he won't talk about it. Uh, it's not important to him. Uh, it's, not, it's not flashy. It's not newsy. He can't put it on a brochure, so he doesn't really care about it. Uh, but newsflash to the LNP, uh, this will be an Olympic issue. Uh, in 10 years' time, what kind of city do we want to have? Do we want to have a city um, that people can find a home in, um, or do we want to have a city that is unattainable for ordinary working people um, to be able to live here? Uh, what kind of Olympic legacy will we have as a city, as Australia's largest city, uh, if we don't have a homelessness strategy? And that's the question this Lord Mayor should be in here answering. But instead, as Councillor Johnston has said, um, he's rolled out his party whip um, to say no to say, no, the Brisbane City Council shouldn't have a homelessness strategy. Well, that's not good enough. Um, uh, and on this side of the chamber, Labor will continue to bring uh, these ideas uh, and these important policy initiatives um, to this council. And, and for Councillor Landers to, uh, to come in here and originally say no, and the amendment is that uh, we don't need one, the state government's doing something, and now to sort of introduce this notion that what we were suggesting would be inconsistent with the state government is disingenuous. Um, at best, what, what, our, um, what our motion was all about was that, that Brisbane City Council develops a homelessness, a new homelessness strategy, given the LNP um, have deleted the old one uh, and not replaced it with anything. We never said that it would be inconsistent with anything the state or federal government, for that matter. Yeah, quite the opposite, to actually work in concert with it. Um, but just, just seeing how the LNP operate in here will, for people out in the community, confirm uh, those worst-held uh, worst suspicions about um, this administration. They're not, they're not your friendly local councillors that are, that are just these quasi-independent people that go around the community and go to community festivals and go to local schools. They are at their heart all LNP politicians. And we, we've seen on display today a statement of very conservative LNP politicians. We've seen, we've seen a statement of values today. Labor values a council that wants to do something about homelessness in our city, and the LNP don't. And that's what we've seen on display today. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. I'll just speak to the amendment. I uh, look forward to making some more substantive comments on the motion as a whole. Uh, I did also want to thank Councillor Cook and the Labor councillors for bringing this motion to the chamber. I think it's quite timely. I've certainly felt for a long time like this council wasn't doing enough to address the issue of homelessness. And I think the, the subtext of this amendment and kind of the initial response from the LNP speaks to an issue that I'm very concerned about, which is that the council administration continues to try to position homelessness and housing as being primarily a state or federal responsibility. And that's the dominant narrative we hear again and again. This is a state issue. It's a state issue. It's not a state issue. It's everyone's responsibility. It's fundamental to the work of local government is to ensure that people have a roof over their heads. Now, council already does a lot in this space without even realising it. And I'm not just talking about the community housing partnership program and the somewhat tokenistic support for the um, Homeless Connect events, but council controls zoning policy. Council is making all these decisions about where new development will be concentrated, about how land is used, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So council is a very active player in housing policy. In fact, you could argue that council probably has more direct levers over the supply of housing, over where new housing is delivered, etc., than the state or federal governments do. So it is extremely misleading and disingenuous for the LNP to say, "Oh, look." We're just falling into line behind the state government strategy. It's a state issue. It's not a state issue. It is a council issue. Above and beyond that, though, 
This council also plays an active role in persecuting the homeless, very directly. I've seen this on numerous occasions. I've had numerous conversations with rough sleepers who tell me that they are hassled and moved on by council employees. I've heard from rough sleepers who've been hassled and discouraged from sleeping in public spaces by council cleaners. I've heard from rough sleepers who've been hassled and discouraged from using public spaces by the council maintenance workers, who are council employees, not subcontractors, who are mowing um, lawns in parks or who are brush cutting around the edges of parks. I've heard from rough sleepers that they also get hassled by subcontractors of council who are engaging in that kind of work. Um, in particular, it sounds like cars are pretty aggressive sometimes with some of these rough sleepers. Often it, it's not a case of saying directly, you're not allowed here, you have to go straight away. It's, hey, it, we're here again every week, again, coming back to tell you that, oh, it'd be nice if you could move soon. So that way the council officers have a level of plausible deniability where they can say, yeah, yeah, we're not moving anyone on. But you kind of are because you're going up to these rough sleepers on a regular basis and telling them that it would be better if they were somewhere else. We did have one example just after Christmas, I think it was, um, when a, someone who was sleeping in their car in a park in Tawong was actually fined for the offence of, of camping. Um, even though they're homeless, they have nowhere else to go. I made some commentary about this at the time, so I won't reiterate it. But um, it was re really good that the, um, I think it was the dispute commissioner overturned the fine. Um, but the fact that council officers are fining people who are homeless for the apparent offence of camping in a public park or for the offence of sleeping in their car is pretty disgusting. And, and when the council says, oh, homelessness is a state issue, it, it rings a little hollow if the council is also fining people for being homeless. Um, not to mention the previous commentary we've had in this chamber about the fact that it's an offence to apparently sleep in the mall, it's an offence to sleep in King George Square. Um, the deputy mayor has been very unapologetic about the fact that council plays loud music from midnight onwards in Queen Street Mall and King George Square to discourage homeless people from sleeping in those spaces. There's a covered area, the covered platform at the back of King George Square is one of the few covered public spaces in the city where it's reasonably safe for someone to sleep because they're out of the weather, but they're also in a fairly central area where there's maybe a few more people around late at night. Um, of all the places that rough sleepers could be sleeping, that's probably one of the, the least bad. Um, it's never safe to be a rough sleeper. You're always vulnerable, um, but at least there, they're in a central location where it's easier for support staff to find them. Um, but council makes it a, an offence to sleep there and plays loud music to discourage people from sleeping there and frequently sends in compliance officers or other council workers to discourage people from sleeping in those spaces. So it's not even a situation where council is, is neutral in this space or saying it's it's none of our business. Council is making it its business to make life more difficult for people who are homeless. So I'm not even annoyed that you're not being part of the solution. I'm annoyed that you're actively exacerbating the problem. And when I heard from that guy who'd been, who'd been fined for sleeping in his car, I called up the council officers involved and I was like, we had a reasonable discussion about it. And they kind of explained to me that they don't have many other tools to deal with this their only option is to issue a fine. And we talked about, well, how does issuing someone who's homeless and struggling to afford rent somewhere, how does issuing them a fine make it easier for them to stop being homeless? And they didn't have a particularly good answer for that. Um, but uh, there are plenty of solutions out there, and I look forward to speaking on, on that in, in a bit more detail when we get to the substantive motion. But I, I do just think this amendment from the LNP is kind of, it's kind of pointless, but if it achieves anything, it is, it is a bad outcome, which is to signal that this is not a primary responsibility of, city, of Brisbane City Council, um, when it very much is. And I know there are a few councillors in the LNP who, who do personally care about this issue. On some level, deep down, they do feel bad um, about homelessness as, as a growing issue in this city. Um, but unless you speak out, unless you put in pressure on the administration to do something differently, you're not actually helping anyone. You might be like, oh yeah, I donate to charity occasionally, and oh yeah, it's really bad that people are homeless. But you're not actually helping the situation. So m maybe now it's time to step up when you've, got, when you've got that much power and influence. I've said this before, the councillors in this chamber are among the most powerful people in the entire city, um, arguably in the entire state of Queensland. You have a great deal of power and influence, uh, perhaps more than you sometimes realise or care to use. 
But um, the city councils in this chamber can and, and are and should be key players in terms of addressing the housing affordability crisis, in terms of addressing homelessness. Uh, we know that for a long time the LNP's dominant strategy has simply been to, been to say, oh, we'll, we'll just approve more private developments, we'll just let developers do whatever they want, that'll fix the problem. Hasn't worked, has it? You've just approved hundreds and hundreds of new dwellings a year. It hasn't made a dent in the housing affordability crisis because housing is treated as a commodity. I'll come to that in more detail later. But uh, the fundamental principle here is that this council administration needs to do a lot more to address this problem rather than passing the buck to other levels of government. So, no, I won't be supporting the, the amendment as it stands. I'd prefer that we debate the original motion. Further speakers to the amendment? Any further speakers to the amendment? We now put the amendment. All in favour of the amendment, at which is adding the words that is to the original motion, adding the words that is consistent with the state government's recently created housing and homelessness action plan for Queensland as it relates to councils. All in favour of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Well, while the division has been called division. by Councillor Cook and Councillor Cumming, eyes to the right, nose to the left, please ring the bells. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 16 in favour and 7 against. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I rise to speak the motion. I'll, I'll, um, again, I, I think it's really nice that we're, we're having this debate today. I've, um, yeah, for many years felt a bit frustrated that the council wasn't doing more to at least talk about this issue, let alone do something about it. Um, and I was also a little bit disappointed in the lead up to the 2020 council election because I'd kind of hoped that at least the Labor Party would make addressing homelessness a stronger part of the policy platform. Um, and maybe it would have been better if there was a bit more discussion and debate around this issue in the lead up to the last election because we might have extracted some tangible com policy commitments. But um, as, as it is, I think we can all see that the homelessness crisis is getting a lot worse in this city. Um, it's been bad and, and getting worse for a while now. And I, I feel like I've been saying this for a long time and, and initially people were like, oh, it's not that bad. And now they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, actually, it is, it is pretty bad. Um, but there's a lot that council itself can do in this space. Um, the first and most obvious change that strikes me is that simply ensuring that homes which are currently sitting empty uh, are, are not left empty long term. And, and there's precedents from councils around the world who've introduced vacancy levies or vacancy taxes of one kind or another. Um, the, the most effective mechanism, I think, within Brisbane City Council is that we already have a rebate for owner-occupier homes. So you get a owner occupiers discount on your rates. Uh, you could have a similar rates discount for tenanted homes. You could even build in uh, a discount where you, get, you only get the discount if you're renting your, your home out for less than market rent. Um, but the point there is that 
A lot of homes would be getting the owner occupied discount. Some homes, they, they'd be getting the rates discount for tenanted homes where the, the landlord can prove that they have a tenant. And anyone who's not getting the owner occupied discount or the landlord discount is charged through the nose and has a higher base rate. Um, and, and that simple change would mean that there's a lot, lot more financial incentive for investors to actually get tenants into their properties. Um, Councillor Landers early ref earlier referred to the vacancy <coughs> rate, and the problem with that rate is that it only it only captures the properties that are actively being advertised. Uh, it doesn't capture the number of properties that are sitting empty long term. And we know that there are thousands of those in the city. We don't know the exact number, and I think this council could perhaps do a better job of trying to count that. Um, but the, the best available estimates based on census data, building completion rates, et cetera, suggest that there could be as many as 20,000 homes across Brisbane which are set in empty long term. A lot of those are apartments in the inner city and then there are quite a few older residential properties out in the burbs. In some cases, investors are simply saying, oh, look, it's, it's not worth the cost of me doing it up to get in tenants. I'll just leave it empty and wait for the values to rise. In other cases, they're um, developers who are waiting for a development application and um, are planning to demolish the home, but in the meantime, it's sitting empty for two or three years. There are a range of reasons that homes sit empty, but um, they don't need to be empty. And certainly when thousands of people are, are at risk of severe homelessness, I think it's completely unacceptable that that's the case in this city. Above and beyond that, there are lots of other empty commercial properties and, and industrial properties. And I think this is something that Councillor Allen and the city planning team should be looking at more closely because Right now, there seems to be a bit of an oversupply of commercial spaces, of certain kinds of office buildings and shop fronts, etc. Yep. Now, some of those buildings, not, not all of them, and perhaps not even most of them, but certainly quite a few of them, could easily be converted to residential accommodation. Um, and here's a private sector solution, so the LNP should be getting all excited about this. It's just, if you adjust your regulatory levers a little bit and make a few tweaks to the city plan, um, you could make it a lot easier to convert old offices and older commercial buildings into residential housing. There are a few examples of this around the city, but they tend to be larger um, major development projects, like we've seen a few of those over at Tenerife where a big old warehouse is converted into apartments. But it can be done on a smaller scale and it can be done relatively cheaply um, if some of those uh, regs are tweaked a little bit in terms of uh, what counts as accessible development and what counts as acceptable development. Often the, the safety standards in terms of fire escapes and exits and all that sort of stuff are higher for commercial buildings. So re adapting those buildings to be safe and appropriate for residential housing is not very expensive or difficult. Uh, it does depend a lot on the buildings themselves, but other cities have already made this shift where they're recognising post-COVID that, look, there's a lot of vacant office space, particularly in inner city areas, that's not going to be needed in, in the near future. Let's make it easier for those owners to adapt those, home, those buildings into homes. Um, so that's another thing that this council can do without any involvement or any real cost, so, uh, without any involvement from the state government or any real cost to council. Simply tweak your city plan rules and codes so that it's easier to convert other classes of um, building into residential accommodation. The other issue we've touched on repeatedly in this place is the conversion of residential accommodation into short-term accommodation. I've been very critical of the LNP for failing to do anything about this. We heard from the last, the last week from the mayor some vague statements about doing something about Airbnb registrations, but this is a really big issue in our city. Uh, we scraped the data off the Airbnb website and found there are about 4,000 properties across Brisbane. There's hundreds more um, on like booking.com and stays and the various other booking websites. So we're potentially talking five, six, seven thousand properties across um, the Brisbane local government area that should be rented out as long-term rental accommodation, but are instead being used as short-term accommodation for tourists. And this is at a time when motel owners are complaining to me that they're having trouble filling some of their rooms. So you've got this conversion of residential homes into short-term accommodation when they're not really designed for tourists and visitors. And then you've got motel owners who are saying, oh, look, we're actually seeing a, a, bit of a, a, bit vari a bit of variability in demand. Um, and there's a solution there, which is that the motel should be the for the visitors and the residential houses and apartments should be the for the long-term residents. That, that, again, is something that council should be looking at more closely and regulating. Uh, the, the bigger piece of the puzzle is, of course, public housing. And 
We know that in the past, Brisbane City Council put land and money towards supporting Brisbane housing company to get established and to deliver different forms of housing stock and different models, but which, some of which could basically be described as public housing. This, it's important, though, to highlight that there's a big difference between public housing, which is rented out at 25 per cent of a person's income, as distinct from schemes like the NRAS schemes and some of the other affordable housing models where rent is 75 per cent of market rent. Um, many of councillors would be aware that some NRAS properties are being phased out at the moment, and that's causing big stresses for residents in certain areas. Um, but even if you do have an NRAS property, 75 per cent of market rent is still pretty damn expensive in some areas. So what we really need to see is for Brisbane City Council to actually support the creation of new public housing. And that is definitely not something that should be left to the state government. Um, the easiest way for B BCC to do this is to simply acquire more properties and bring them into the Community Housing Partnerships Program. There's already an existing model there. It's not like you'd have to set up a whole new structure or a whole new team. Just buy more dwellings and, put, um, and bring them into that existing stock for the um, CHPP. Oh, CHHP? Yeah. Um, CHPP, is it? Um, the, the number of dwellings there is pretty low for a city of our size, and there's no obvious explanation to me why BCC can't add a lot more dwellings to that program. Um, it can, in fact, be a source of revenue for the community orgs that we invite to manage those properties. It can potentially also be a source of revenue for council, or at least a, an asset to invest in. Um, but fundamentally, the problem we have in this city is that, the, that housing is still treated as a commodity and a way to make profit. Uh, and I'd be interested in hearing from the Labor councillors, firstly, do you support the idea that um, things like vacancy levies could be introduced at the council level? I think there is an interesting question of, about whether it's legally possible. I think it is, but then there's a question of should we, and I think we should. I'd also be he interested in hearing from the Labor councillors, though, um, as, as to whether you want property prices to fall because the LNP have said repeatedly in place that they want property values to keep rising, and shame on them for that. That is really, really bad. It's messed up that you want property values to continue rising. You should be embarrassed about that. You're, you are actively contributing to the homelessness situation by encouraging that state of affairs. If that's changed and you actually want house prices to fall now, then great, let's hear about it. Um, but unfortunately, the only thing the LNP seems to be doing is to continually up zone areas for new development and that has the effect of increasing the land values, which in turn has the effect of increasing house prices, which in turn puts upward pressure on the value of new apartments which are delivered. So rather than increasing the supply of new housing, rezoning land for high density development simply puts upward pressure on property values and property prices in general. It's not a solution. We need public housing and we need a stronger action from this council to reduce the number of properties that are being left vacant and being converted to short term accommodation. Thanks. Councillor. Three further speakers. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'll just speak briefly um, about the new amended motion this evening. Um, what I want to talk about is the process from here and what are the next steps. So obviously Labor is fully supportive of a homelessness strategy for the city. Uh, in preparing for today and for the original notice of motion, there are a number of documents um, that I looked at and reviewed and discussed with my uh, caucus colleagues. Um, one of those documents, of course, um, was the Queensland Housing and Homelessness Action Plan uh, 2021 to 2025. Um, interesting document, doesn't talk a lot about council um, and that council is on the front line, uh, but noted, of course, anything in the Brisbane City Council homelessness strategy uh, should not be inconsistent with that document. In fact, as Councillor Cassidy and others have identified, we need to have a consistent collaborative approach uh, to these types of issues. Another document um, that I looked at was actually the homelessness to housing strategy from the state government back in 2020, uh, featuring uh, Campbell Newman at the time. Uh, another interesting document that also does talk about the role of local councils um, in addressing homelessness. Another document, um, the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement um, at a federal level. There are strategies at a federal level. Um, in fact, the Australian Local Government Association advocated very strongly for local councils uh, to be included as part of that national uh, strategy and agreement for the purpose that we are on the front line. Uh, we do deal with people day to day who are facing homelessness um, and recognising the critical role that councils have to play in addressing homelessness. 
Um, in reviewing some of the other council's strategies, um, particularly the City of Port Phillip, uh, City of uh, Sydney, City of Melbourne strategies, um, all of those strategies are very comprehensive and provide uh, practical solutions to addressing homelessness in those respective cities. Uh, their uh, numbers, their data on homelessness is significantly lower than Brisbane City Council. But um, I think that Council, in taking these next steps towards developing our own strategy, uh, will see that uh, we already are taking steps to address homelessness. What this strategy does is formalises, expands and has some real accountability in terms of ensuring that we are doing everything we can, uh, not just on the ground but from a policy level, to ensure that we're addressing those issues. Um, Noosa Council should also be commended there. Uh, Noosa Social Strategy, um, a really, really good document as well, and talks about um, they have clearly done quite significant planning uh, in talking to their councillors about um, what vision they have for Noosa and what they want to see. And um, I'd encourage all councillors to have a look at, at their social strategy as well. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Will Councillor Cook take a question? Uh, perhaps at the end. <laughs> <laughs> OK, sure, at the end I'll get up. Um, but what I also want to talk about is, um, and this is the last document I'll refer to, is um, the University of Adelaide actually did a, a paper, and it's called, titled, A Toolkit for Local Government in the Role of Local Government in Addressing Homelessness. And um, that document actually refers to um, the US Interagency Council on Homelessness, and they identified that there are actually broadly seven factors that are considered vital for a homelessness strategy within local government. So those are uh, collaborative planning processes, taking a research and data-driven approach, ensuring performance and outcome orientation, welcoming innovation and creativity, having the endorsement by elected councillors, ensuring involvement of stakeholders, and finally monitoring and evaluation of implementation. Um, so I guess from my perspective, I think that the fact that we have, um, well, and I'm assuming we will have full support from all councillors in this place this evening, um, except I guess the Lord Mayor's not here, I'm assuming that he will also support this. Um, what we now need to do is um, take those steps to move it forward. What we saw with the domestic violence strategy, and um, I commend uh, Councillor Adam Allen, who was very good in taking a bipartisan approach to that issue. Um, he ensured that councillors, uh, including myself, were consulted uh, prior to uh, the draft document being prepared and also ensured that we were consulted in relation to highly localised support services that we were aware of, both in our local area and citywide. Um, what didn't happen as part of that process um, there was consultation with community organisations, but there wasn't really a working group. I think that what we could do better this time is perhaps establish a working group early on, um, which is bipartisan in nature, and also has the input of those community or relevant community services, um, including micro projects, um, particularly organisations who have addressed the chamber, like uh, Bed Down, who have spoken to us previously, uh, for voices and potentially also domestic violence support organisations. If we can get all of those organisations involved early, I think that we can probably narrow uh, what the key uh, and urgent and pressing issues um, that our city is facing today are, and then make sure that we incorporate them into the strategy. What I'd also like to see um, this time with the homelessness strategy is clear and defined um, periods for review and um, you know, it, it loathes me a little bit to say the word KPI, but I do think that we do need to have um, tangible outcomes that we can that are measurable. Because um, what we have seen with the domestic violence strategy is that, um, and as I asked this morning of the Lord Mayor, you know, what steps are we taking to review that document? Um, it's now been a few years in circulation. Uh, it, it was really a starting point where this document will be similar. Um, we do not have a current strategy for the city. We've got initiatives, um, but there is no clearly defined strategy. So I think a working group that is collaborative, that can, of course, um, involve representatives from the state government, given that we are specifically ensuring uh, that the state government's newly created housing and homelessness strategy action plan, um, that we're not inconsistent with that, 
um, we should, of course, include representatives of, from the state government as part of that process. Point so, of order, Chair. Point of order, you, Councillor. Councillor Cook, take a question now. Sure, Councillor. Go Shreen. on. I'll um, take it. Thanks. Yeah, through you, Chair. Just. The Homeless Connect used to happen at City Hall, but the last couple of Homeless Connects have happened out the race course, and I think the next one's happening at Bowen Hills. Would the Labor Party agree that it's time to reconsider hosting Homeless Connect back at City Hall so it's more accessible to people in the inner city? Uh, look, um, th thank you for the question, Councillor Shree. Um, having attended uh, the last uh, Homeless Connect at the... Um, de at, at, no? Doombin, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it was at the RNA, it was at the showgrounds. Um, so having attended that event, it is a very large event. Um, the number of service providers there um, was enormous, as well as the food court area where the barbecue was, they had bands. Um, I'm actually just from a very practical perspective, I'm not sure it would fit. However, um, what you could do is potentially have um, more events that are smaller in size more frequently. So, um, of course, I'm not opposed to that. I actually think that we should open up City Hall um, much more to people, you know, it's the people's place. And in fact, um, the 50 plus centre underneath um, here does receive some use outside of hours. Um, but I do think, and when I, had met previously with Bed Down, I thought that that in fact would actually be an ideal location um, to give people access to showers, give people access to, um, you know, facilities and to service providers so that um, similarly like places like Common Ground where you have service providers where people are, um, particularly in the inner city, on a more frequent basis and whether or not that's incorporated with the Red Cross Cafe, um, the Night Cafe or other service providers, look, there's, there's so many opportunities. And I think that is um, the frustration, certainly from my, myself, um, is we could do so much more. It just takes people to um, stop and think about who we want to um, help and make conscious and very deliberate actions to actually help them. And I think that we have got um, an incredible city, but of course it could be better and we have an obligation to help those most in need. So um, Labor will of course be supporting the creation of this homelessness strategy. Um, I'm not sure which chair will be responsible uh, for the development and implementation of this strategy. Um, last time it came under city governance. Um, it may come under city governance again or perhaps um, lifestyle and community services. Um, certainly I would like to see Councillor Howard take this on. I think that she does have a real commitment to helping those most in need. Um, certainly anything I've ever brought to her on this issue, she has um, tried her best to assist with. So I think um, she would be a good fit, but certainly I don't make those decisions. Uh, so I'll leave that one uh, to the mayor and others to make that determination. But um, I'm putting my hand up to say I would love to be part of a working group. I think this is a really good opportunity for the city. I think it's a good opportunity for all of us to work collaborati collaboratively to make a real difference. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cook. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston? Well, yes. Uh, just a couple of things I didn't in include in the um, initial comments I made, and I'm, I'm still waiting from anybody from the LNP to stand up and speak, and perhaps the city planning chairperson or the community's chairperson, but uh, I, I guess they delegate it to the whip um, in the LNP. Um, I just wanted to put on the record a couple more things. Councillor Shree, when he was speaking, reminded me that when Councillor um, Adams was a planning chairperson, this is years ago now, um, she refused to consider a motion that I put forward um, relating to um, essentially inappropriate housing, um, that is boarding houses that are springing up in low density areas. What is that two or three years ago, Councillor Griffiths? It's a while ago, yes. Yeah. It's, it's two to three years ago. And, um, uh, we have a problem in low density areas where these de facto boarding houses are being built where they're not appropriately zoned. And um, there's, there's several problems with this. Um, firstly, uh, they are being presented to unsuspecting members of the public as units when they're not. Um, they are often uh, on the plans, they uh, don't present um, necessarily as boarding houses. They have their own kitchens and bathrooms and it's not a share house kind of uh, scenario which is envisaged under low density. Um, and thirdly, they are three to four hundred dollars per room, per room. 
So they're exploiting vulnerable people um, as well. Um, now, all of these issues have become a problem in my ward in multiple suburbs and in Councillor Griffith's ward, and I've brought motions to this place in previous years. And the explanation of the then planning chairperson, Councillor um, Adams, was we're developing a housing strategy. That was two, three, two to three years ago. No, no, we couldn't. Uh, she, she, uh, from memory, Councillor Adams uh, tabled the motion, refused to let it get back onto the agenda for a long time, and then it came forward and she voted it down. Um, and the explanation given at that time, and, and I probably should have done more homework for this and looked up when that was, but Councillor Adams said we're developing a housing strategy. Where is it? Three years later, she's off to party in Greece for the Olympics and there's no housing strategy. Now, Councillor Adam, he's probably got no idea. Uh, I, I don't even know if he was here. He was probably finance chair at the time. He would have just put his hand up and voted against the motion as the LNP normally does. Um, but let's be clear. Uh, these um, issues have been brought forward in this chamber and the excuse that's been given by the now deputy mayor when she was in charge of city planning was, we are developing a housing strategy. Well, all all, in, um, all evidence to the contrary. Um, Councillor Adams hasn't got up and told us what's happened to that housing strategy. Councillor Landers has been sent out. She's been sent out on forward patrol. She's been sent out to, uh, to uh, run interference and explain why we shouldn't have to, as a council, have a housing strategy or have a response as part of that housing strategy to address homelessness. I mean, the LNP could have actually gone back to Councillor Adams' stated position um, when they moved their amendment that we're developing a housing strategy and we'll make the homelessness policy part of our housing strategy. Did they decide to do that? No, they did not. They've just decided to try and kill it and say it's the state government's responsibility, which is, which is pretty bad effort. I can only presume there is no housing strategy um, because it's never come forward. It's been years. Um, it, it's, nothing's ever happened, so uh, it's just reminded me, and I'll just flag this term, I'll bring back my amendment on uh, the dodgy boarding houses, uh, and uh, we'll get some change happening there, because it's clear this administration has fallen asleep at the wheel, um, and that they are not looking at what we can do, as Councillor Shree rightly pointed out, within the planning scheme um, to, address, uh, to address the issues of housing. It, it's very clear that the nature of cities um, is changing as a result of, of COVID. And this administration is so beholden to the commercial property sector um, that they refuse to look at any kind of innovation or any kind of change. And I, I think that is problematic. Uh, so, I, I mean, it, 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 the excuses that they're coming up with now are pretty lazy when they've got to say, well, it's the state government's responsibility, when it's only you know, their own housing strategy that they're supposed to be looking at these things and they've just abandoned that altogether. So I, I, think that, um, I think that it's really interesting that uh, uh, Councillor Adam hasn't spoken today, Councillor Howard hasn't spoken. Councillor Shree also made some really good points about how Council actively um, put pressure on homeless uh, people sleeping rough. And it, it can be a problem in certain um, parts of the city. Um, I would prefer, obviously, that no one had to sleep under the portico out in King George Square, that everybody had a safe home and a safe bed. And that's the objective I think we should be um, working towards. So again, I just want to thank Councillor Cook and the Labor Party for bringing this forward. I'm sorry that the LNP is playing games um, with your very good motion uh, here before us today. Um, and I'm just really disappointed that this U Butte housing strategy that the LNP have been working on for years and years I mean, the Deputy Mayor is really busy with this, I'm sure. Um, maybe she'll have some time on the 24-hour flight to Greece to go to the party uh, to revise where she got to with the housing strategy. She could type up a little memo for Councillor Allen and then on the return flight she could just bounce it off to Councillor Allen and he could read it and see where they got up to with the housing strategy. Because having a homelessness policy and a homelessness strategy um, would be a really good thing. And I just want to reiterate that I think we should be working absolutely more through the Brisbane Housing Corporation um, to address a lot of these issues. Um, thank you again, Councillor Cook. Thank you. Further speakers?
further speakers? Councillor Thomas Summers got to stand. <laughs> yeah, Councillor Howard is desperate yeah. to speak because uh, thank you, Ms. Do I have the call? Yes, you have a call, Councillor Thank Howard. you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, um, well, it's been an interesting debate. Um, and can I say up front that I'm rising to speak in support of this motion? But also up front, can I just put on the record my enormous thanks to the safe communities of the inclusive communities team? Can I say that some of the dialogue that has been said in this chamber this afternoon is appalling? It is inaccurate and it does not at all reflect the work that those amazing people do. I'm yet to see some of these Point people. Of order, Point of order, I'm happy to retract or clarify my statement. I, I was not at all referring to the Safe Communities team. I haven't heard these complaints. I'm not sure Councillor Howe referred to anyone in particular. I do. No, okay. Some of the comments that have been made are not accurate. I'll just leave it at that. What I do want to put on the record is my thanks to the Safe Communities team. I know that those PSLOs work incredibly hard. And as Councillor Cook has mentioned in her speech, she saw many of them at the last, um, at the last uh, event that we had out at the RNA. They all donate their time. It is amazing. It's just amazing what they do. And I just want to put that on the record up front. Um, Look, Brisbane City Council has a long-standing role in addressing homelessness and supporting our vulnerable communities. Um, we've been doing it forever. Um, the, the reference to the, um, to the previous housing, what was it, the homelessness um, strategy, 2002 to 2006. It's taken this long for someone to say, oh, where is it? Well, I'll tell you why it's not there. It's embedded in our inclusive Brisbane plan. It's what we do every single day of the week. Every single day of the week, we have PSLOs doing their job. Now, I'm going to go through some of the things that have already been mentioned, and I'll, uh, I'll give Councillor Cook uh, credit for doing the research and what she's done. And um, can I just say that we are very supportive of this document. We're very supportive of the, the fact that the state government has a Queensland Housing and Homelessness Action Plan, an action plan that mentions council. And that is what we will be working collaboratively with all levels of government. Council has allocated more than $2.95 million in its annual plan and budget for the 21-22 year to support programs that respond to homelessness and affordable housing. And we will continue to fund initiatives that support our most vulnerable residents. However, we recognise that all levels of government have a role to play in addressing the challenges of homelessness and housing right across Brisbane, Queensland and Australia. This isn't just about the Brisbane CBD. While the Queensland State Government has the primary responsibility Point for housing and homelessness in Point Queensland... Point of order for you, Will Councillor Howard take a quick question? No, Councilor I don't Howard, have time. Question? No. Um, let me start again. While the Queensland State Government has the primary responsibility for housing and homelessness in Queensland, what is just so critically important in this debate is that all levels of government work collaboratively to address the ongoing social and economic challenges associated with homelessness and social isolation. It is not just about giving someone a roof over their head. Council recognises the important role that we have to point play order, in addressing point of order, sleeping. Three. Just, just one more time. On no, that point, would Councillor Howard take a quick you, question? No. Eating into my time. Councillor Sree, no. Councillor Howard has indicated she won't take a question. Thank you, Councillor Council Howard. Council recognises the important role that we have to play in addressing rough sleeping and social isolation. But we understand that that means working collaboratively with other levels of government and not addressing these complex issues in isolation from one another. Further, we know as well that supporting those at risk or experiencing homelessness is not just a priority for Brisbane City Council, but for all levels of government and the important community partners that support our most vulnerable. And it is an issue right across the state of which we are part. So much of the great work this council has been able to do and achieve has been through our collaborative partnerships with the social housing providers, the not-for-profits, the support service providers who really worked so hard to get people back on their feet. 
Let's talk about Homeless Connect. Next, just next week, Council will be running its 25th Homeless Connect event on Thursday, the 19th of May, at the Brisbane Showgrounds. Through this initiative, Council partners with community service providers who support those at risk of or experiencing homelessness to access health care, housing and community support. It is an amazing event and it can only happen with the partners that Council uh, uses. The project has helped more than 19,000 people and is part of Brisbane City Council's commitment to improve quality of life for all residents. Homeless Connect is a great example of the types of outcome Council can achieve when a collaborative and inter-service approach is taken to address the challenges our residents face. Let's talk about the Pathways Out of Homelessness program, a program initiated by this Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor Adrian Schroeder. Let me repeat that into, the, into Hansard. Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner is the person who brought in Pathways Out of Homelessness, an unbelievable $3 million over the three years. Do you know how many times these organisations have said to me what an amazing grant this was? And I've heard people in the, in the chamber talk about the, 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 the information that they get from their organisations as well. This has been an amazing success because of the collaboration between the, the services. That had never happened in the past. As part of this program, Councilors, we've allocated $1 Councilors million three, dollar every year for the past three years to organisations three, and charities please. that are helping to tackle homelessness with new, innovative and sustainable solutions and giving them, giving them the support they need to create collaborative, integrated and sustainable pathways. It's the sustainability that we need to address. Funded organisations are reporting to Council that this investment has supported vulnerable residents to not re-enter homelessness by retaining their accommodation, gaining professional support from health and financial services, improving their wellbeing and maintaining their social connections. Again, I cannot stress enough how important it has been to work with these support organisations who have made a direct impact on the lives of those that we have supported through this program. I'm not going to mention too much about the, 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 the housing project, um, we have talked about that. Brisbane Housing Company, we had the CEO of Brisbane Housing Company come and address this chamber. People seem to forget that. The, the CEO could not speak highly enough of what we were doing in collaboration and not only with the amount of funding that we give. Councillor Strange, Chair, please. I, I listen to you with respect and, we, and I don't get the same in return. Okay. So. Can I just say that the Brisbane Housing Company, again, has done some amazing work with other services where they've collaborated to provide the roof over the head of the less vulnerable, while the services can wrap those services around. And having that three-year grant has been a godsend for that happening. I just want to um, speak again to the motion, and it's just so important to recognise that the debate today um, is that none of the services that the Brisbane City Council delivers to address and improve the outcomes of those at risk takes place in isolation. It's by developing an integrated and sustainable pathway out of homelessness that we have played a role in actively getting those sleeping rough back on their feet, and this is what we aim to continue to by, by supporting this motion today. I just want to quote from page seven of the action plan. The action plan is about boosting housing supply, moving forward towards ending homelessness, supporting vulnerable people and securing a fair and accessible housing system. We share these objectives with our community partners and other government agencies. We all have a shared responsibility to work together to improve outcomes for all Queenslanders. That is a direct quote from the state action plan one that we support. So this amended motion reinforces Brisbane City Council's support for a collaborative, integrated response which indicates our willingness to work closely with all levels of government. The spirit of this action plan really is all about collaboration and working together, and we strongly support this sensible and considered approach by the Queensland State Government. Again, in the spirit of collaboration and the recognition that all levels of government need to work closely to improve the outcomes of all vulnerable residents, I urge you all to support this motion. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. I'm sure glad I waited for that, uh, Chair. Um, 
Can Councillor Howard um, just said that in the LNPs, in the LNPs little world over there, that they do this work every day and they're working on, on, on addressing homelessness each and every day because it's built into everything the council does, according to Councillor Howard. And yet, and yet an hour ago, an hour ago, they were opposing, they are trying to stop it. They, they moved an amendment to specifically say, which is specifically say that council shouldn't have, under the LNP, a council shouldn't have a homelessness um, strategy. Um, because the state has one apparently, but now the speech was slightly amended to say that we will work collaboratively because they couldn't, they couldn't get rid of the motion, legally couldn't get rid of the motion. At no point did Labor councillors, I'm not sure who Councillor Howe was referring to, at no point did Labor councillors reflect on the public space liaison officers and the safe communities team or any of the team that works in the Homeless Connect projects or, or across um, the Lifestyle and Community Services Division at all. Um, we value their work, we value it so much we value it so much that we are bringing to the table, we're bringing to council a proposal for a new homelessness strategy that should include that should include increased resources for that team. Now, I know I personally meet with and work with our public space liaison officers, and and my office does on a regular basis in trying to help rough sleepers and people who are recently recently homeless as well, and working with local organisations like Sandbag. Um, they don't come they don't come to me, Councillor Howard, through your chair and say, oh, no, it works great. We don't need any more resources it's all fine um, out there because we well, what we know what we know um, here in in Brisbane and South East Queensland and Queensland more broadly that the vacancy rate now is 0.7 per cent Councillor Landers said earlier it was 1 per cent it's actually a lot less than that uh, there, there is basically operationally no vacancies in private rentals in Brisbane anymore um, the house price increases we have seen in the last 12 months is 32.1 per cent on average so to answer your question uh, earlier Councillor Shree or your, your comment. Um, I don't think that level of growth is sustainable going forward or isn't sustainable in what has occurred. I do think house prices should be lower, in fact. Um, unit prices have increased to 479000 and rental prices have increased by 22.3 per cent in the last 12 months. And what we, what we see at, the, at, at an LNP level here in Council trying to trying to get in the way of good um, policy. We also see at a federal level uh, the L LNP government, the Liberal National um, Government, um, bringing the NRAS scheme to an end. So we've got people all over Brisbane who currently live in, in what are affordable um, uh, units for those families and those people facing the prospect of later this year and next year having to leave, having to leave their home because they can't afford, they can't afford to rent anymore. So instead of living in the city of Brisbane and being able to work in the city of Brisbane, frontline workers, whether they're hospital cleaners or nurses or teachers or, or people who work in coffee shops who uh, we like to go to when we're in the city or out in the suburbs, instead of being able to live in Brisbane and have a home in Brisbane uh, and be part of the Brisbane community, they will be forced to, um, to live at, at, at Caboolture West or at Narangbar or Moray Field. Um, or further afield or, or south of Logan uh, because, because we see decisions of governments, decisions of conservative governments, um, uh, forcing people out of our city. Um, Councillor Howard was really proud, proud to say that um, the, the budget for over the last three years, it's been $3 million over three years um, on that initiative to respond to homelessness that the Lord Mayor introduced. Now let's just think about that for a second. It's a million dollars a year over the last three years. That's, that's $3 million over the last three years. The Brisbane City Council budget over the last three years has been over $10 billion. So this LNP administration and the, the chair who's responsible for this, this policy area is proud that out of $10 billion, $10 billion, $3 million has been committed to addressing homelessness in our city. Three Claim to be misrepresented. Well, that's not a point of order, but Take okay. Take point of order, please, first, Councillor Howe. Point of order to you, Councillor Howe. Claim to be misrepresented. Thank you, noted. Well, maybe she's not proud. I wouldn't be proud of that, Chair. If I was Councillor Howard, I would not be proud to stand up in this place and say that it was a good outcome that this Lord Mayor, who couldn't be bothered to be here today, tonight, to debate this important policy, he was proud and she was proud uh, to, to say that out of $10 billion, all they could scratch together was $3 million. They should be ashamed of that effort, Chair. Now, that's, that's actually 
uh, you know, that's half of what a year's advertising budget is, over three years. So, so in, in, in three years, the Lord Mayor spends $15 million on his advertising budget and yet can only find $3 million. I wouldn't be proud of that, Councillor Howard. Through you, through you, three million dollars. Good point. Three million dollars on the Brisbane app. How does that help people um, put a roof over their head uh, and make sure that they? Point they're... of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order to well, you. Councillor Cassidy, take uh, a question. Councillor Cassidy, yeah, sure. take a question. Uh, which programs in the budget would you like to be cut for your um, homelessness projects? Advertising. Why don't we cut advertising? Uh, why don't we? Why don't we get rid of all this stupid Brisbane app advertising and put it into home and in addressing homelessness? Why don't we? Why don't we get that two hundred million dollars that you earmarked for the Olympics, uh, the, this broadcast centre that you'd already programmed in borrowing for? And why don't we put that into addressing homelessness? If we invested that with the likes of the Brisbane Housing Company, they could deliver thousands and thousands. Of Deputy Mayor, please. Absolutely, absolutely. We should be support. I'm sorry. Olympic legacy. Olympic legacy should be about a livable city and, a, and an affordable city. The deputy mayor thinks an Olympic legacy should be about some stupid broadcasting centre over at West End. I mean, this this is the values proposition that is being put to the people of Brisbane tonight. The deputy mayor and the Lord Mayor and Councillor Howard and all the LNP councillors prefer their advertising budget. They prefer talking about the Olympics 10 years away, but they don't care about families who are living precariously. They don't care about those families that are raising children in the backs of their cars and trying to get them to school, trying to get them um, cleaned Point and of order, trying Mr. to get Point them of order fed. to you, Deputy Mayor. I know he's on a roll, but he is imputing motive, and I ask you to bring back to the... <laughs> saying that Liberal councillors don't care is imputing motive is incorrect. <laughs> Their actions show they don't care. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What they do and the policies that they have in place here, Chair, in my mind, um, show that they really care about things more than addressing homelessness. They care about their advertising budget. They care about these glitzy inner city things. They, they care about the bendy bus and the metros. The parties in Greece, of course, Councillor Johnson. They care about that more than they care about addressing homelessness, and they have demonstrated that through their actions in here. Now, let's. The, Councillor Howard finished up talking about, well, not quite finished, but did talk about Brisbane Housing Company. This is where I will, where I will finish. Um, in my discussions with the Brisbane Housing Company, they would love more council support. Uh, they would love more council support. So, so what, what, what would kill a project that is very marginal? Affordable and social housing projects are extremely marginal. Not sure if any LNP councillor understands what it takes to get a, an affordable or social housing project off the ground uh, in leveraging um, institutional investors like superannuation funds. It is extremely marginal. And when they come to a project and, and approach council and put a DA in and are made to jump through all the hoops uh, for that, and then, and then get whacked with those exorbitant infrastructure charges, that can mean the difference between an affordable or social housing project going forward or not. Now, we've seen this LNP administration over recent years bring policies in to give infrastructure charge holidays and discounts to certain projects. Now, were they ever affordable and social housing projects? Uh, they were five-star hotels, they were student accommodation, they were aged care um, discounts, and, and you know, we can argue the merits of all of them. But you cannot argue that affordable and social housing uh, isn't of great merit, and at the moment in the crisis we're facing greater merit. Uh, you, can't have, you can't have a city that, um, that prioritises billionaires building five-star hotels of accommodation in our city instead of social and affordable housing providers. I wonder whether, I wonder whether this LNP administration Point of has... Order, Mr. Chair. Point of order to Would you, Councillor Cassidy take a question? I think I'm actually nearly out of time. I don't think I've got time. Sorry. You, you've got to, you've got to, I, I won't, yeah, I won't, uh, Chair, but um, Councillor Allen can certainly make his point um, in the debate, and he can get that on record, whatever um, is troubling his mind at the moment. Um, but we should be supporting the Brisbane Housing Company. Now, now the Lord Mayor accuses, accuses opposition councillors of never bringing anything to the table. Well, in the last few weeks, we've brought some significant things to the table and we've been talking about issues that are fundamental to the kind of city we want to see in 10 years' time. Uh, well, actually, um, fundamentally right now, here today. Uh, and we're talking about addressing homelessness. We're talking about addressing the housing affordability crisis. And all this, all this administration can talk about are those glitzy inner city projects uh, that will be exacerbating this, prob this problem um, uh, rather than addressing it. And again, again, 
This just highlights the values in this chamber. Those that sit there and sit in the LNP care more about themselves than the people of Brisbane. Thanks, Councillor Cassidy. Your time has expired. Councillor Howard, your point of misrepresentation. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Councillor Cassidy seemed to indicate that I was saying that all we invested was $3 million. The $3 million was the Shrinner Council investment in pathways out of homelessness. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Any further speakers? No further speakers? No further speakers. Uh, councillors, we now move to the vote on the, uh, the substantive motion, which is, I'll read it, that Brisbane City Council creates a new homelessness strategy for the City of Brisbane that is consistent with the State Government's recently created Housing and Homelessness Action Plan for Queensland as it relates to council. Order, does Council Landers get to sum up? For oh. Yeah, which was supported. No. No. no, I think we move straight to the vote at this point. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. Voting on, voting on the substantive motion. All in favour of the substantive motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division Seconded. called by Councillor Adams and Councillor uh, Hutton. Oh, sorry, Councillor Owen. OK. <laughs> please ring the bells. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Sounds like everyone's moving to the right. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 23 in favour. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. So we now move to petitions. Are there any petitions, councillor? Yes, Mr. Chair. Councillor Owen. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a petition to present on behalf of Councillor Murphy, requesting extra services of the P443 express bus. Thank you. Any further petitions? No further petitions. Could I please have a motion for receipt of that petition, please? Mr Chair, I move that the petition as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. Second. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Hutton and uh, seconded by Councillor Strunk that the petition as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, uh, the next item is general business. Are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? No one standing. Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. I rise uh, just briefly to uh, inform the Chamber about uh, an event that we had uh, in the city a couple of weeks ago called Run Army. Run Army? Um, yep. Run Army came out of a concept uh, that Major General Jake Elwood had. A uh, very similar event is run in Washington uh, for the US Marines. And the objective of Run Army is to basically bring the community and the defence force together. And I'm very happy to say uh, that the event that was held in our city um, did that very, very well. The event itself consisted of a 10k run and a 5k run. Uh, the 5k run was uh, basically around the city. The 10k run was through the city into New Farm and then along Kangaroo Point and then back into the city again. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Run Army was that it promoted 
health, well-being, mental health, community and mateship. And I have to say, uh, when I reached out to, to my friends and some new friends, um, I was quite uh, amazed at how many people jumped on board. Uh, we had Councillor Landers, one of Councillor Landers' staff join me uh, for the run. Somebody who traditionally heckles me from the rugby field as she's running down the sideline. Uh, and I have to, I have to thank Miranda for, for joining me. It was a six month uh, training expedition on my half. I had never run 10 kilometres in my life. Never ever done it. I'm not a runner. I did confess to uh, Major General Elwood that um, running is not my passion. I don't think it's something that I really like. I think it's something that my body loathes. Uh, but we worked through that. And uh, one thing that we did prove to, to all of us, our, our six-man team, was that um, we can do it. As a team, we did do it. Uh, one of the policies that we had, or one of the rules, I should say, uh, was that we wanted to cross the line together, the finish line together. And to do that, uh, we ran as fast as the slowest person would allow. We were a team. In the build-up to the event, we had done things like gone out to dinner, we went abseiling, we did a whole bunch of things together just to build that teamship and that mateship and reinforce some of the things that Run Army was actually trying to to get into people's minds, that this is, this is uh, an event to bring community and defence together. We did that. I'm happy to say uh, that we actually completed the 10Ks in under an hour, which uh, for somebody, for myself, who's never run 10Ks before, um, was, was a bit of an achievement. Um, also on my team, I had a former defence personnel who had spent time uh, in Afghanistan and through our training and our, in our uh, coming together for coffees and what have you, we had a few of his stories. And some of his life experiences um, overseas were horrific and I would not wish that on anybody. Um, but the thing was, was that we created a forum. We had a friendly space and these stories could be shared. And that was another wonderful thing. Uh, we had a former netballer who was a diamond. Um, definitely not a diamond in the rough. Um, definitely somebody who is highly motivated and definitely somebody who told us to train harder than the game. And I think we achieved what we set out to do, which was to work together, to finish, to enjoy the whole event. And we did do that. We did that very, very successfully. One of the wonderful things about Run Army was uh, while you're on that run, there are a whole bunch of defence personnel every kilometre or so encouraging you along. They are in full fatigues or dress uniform, just giving you a keep going, you know, it's all good. They had uh, Army assets out as well. We had an Apache flying overhead just to push us along that little bit. Uh, we had a couple of houses, uh, the big guns, at the end of the finish line, and you ran between them, which was amazing. Uh, our starting was a gun from Kangaroo Point, um, which you could have heard across the whole city. But for me, the biggest thing, apart from finishing as a team, was the start. There was two or 3,000 of us all piled in together for the start, and the gun went off and everybody starts running in the one direction. Everybody was happy. Everybody was having such a wonderful time. And then off to the side, there's the Lord Mayor, high-fiving everybody as they're going past. It was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful event. I think he was busy <laughs> for the rest of the day, but uh, it, was still, it was still appreciative that he was there. Um, they had the band. They had one wretch. Uh, army band at the beginning playing on the footpath as everybody ran past. Uh, it was a really <coughs> great event. Uh, at the end there was entertainment uh, and one reg uh, army band was up on stage, they were singing uh, as well. So it had this really festival atmosphere. 
Some of the gear was there for inspection, so members of the public could go and have a look at some of the Army assets. They also had a, uh, a helicopter simulator uh, on site as well that you could actually sit in and fly an Army helicopter, which was a real buzz. Um, out of that event, out of that one event, which was a fundraiser for Legacy, um, they raised over $170,000 to go towards Legacy to help families uh, that have lost their income provider, their, their father, their mother, their sister, their brother. All of those funds that we raised um, goes towards that fam the Legacy. And I really want to um, pay tribute to Brendan Cox, the CEO of Legacy, um, who also joined us on our training as well. Very, very fit man, might I say. Uh, and I really want to thank him for his encouragement uh, in the run as well. I also want to thank uh, Major General Jake Elwood for actually pulling me into the vent. As many of the councillors know here, uh, Inogra Base is very close to my ward. A lot of my uh, residents are defence personnel. And I have been out with six RAR and Legacy when they've done, uh, gone to people's homes to help them out. So I've seen firsthand what Legacy do and how our defence personnel support Legacy on the ground in people's homes. It's absolutely fantastic. I also uh, want to finish up by thanking all the volunteers of the day. Uh, you, in the Army, you can, be, you can either volunteer or you can be told. But every single defence personnel that was there on the day was volunteering. Nobody was ordered to be there. It was absolutely fantastic the amount of support that our defence personnel came out to show their appreciation for the community that was helping them. And I really want to uh, give praise to the event. I want to thank the Lord Mayor uh, for supporting the event. And uh, I want to thank Major General Jake Elwood for putting the countdown on two days ago to do it all again next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for dinner for a period of one hour, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Council adjourn for a dinner break for a period of one hour, which commences when councillors have vacated the chamber. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. A division has been called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Sree. Please ring the bells. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Please bring the. Please read. I'll make sure my mic on. Please read the results. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 15 in favour and four against. Thank you. The result of the revision is a affirmative for a dinner break for one hour, which starts when the doors are shut. Thank you. Turn the mic on. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Uh, we're still in general business. Pardon. Is there any more general, any further speakers in general business? No, no further speakers in general business. Thank you, um, councillors. The next item before us is the motion moved by, earlier by Councillor Johnson. Councillor, would you like to read your motion? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The motion before us uh, that I moved earlier today. 
uh, relates to the. Can, can uh, you just move it? Because I think we need a second to Councillor Johnson. It's so been moved can you just and move seconded. The because the, the, the councillor who seconded isn't here. So um, I just, if you could just move the motion and have it seconded, and then then we can get to debate. I thought it was moved and seconded earlier, and that's why it got moved to later in the agenda. Can I take it as seconded? Okay, fine. Sorry, Councillor Johnson. Your clock starts now. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion, which I'm happy to review for everybody, but it was moved and seconded to my knowledge, um, is that we implement the recommendation from the 2022 uh, flood review uh, to fund uh, the backflow valves. Um, now, it's very interesting to me that today um, the Brisbane City Council 2022 flood review was handed down by Justice, uh, former J Chief Justice Paul de Jersey. Um, we didn't get any notice of this. Uh, a journalist happened to, to ask me to comment on it, and that's how I found out about it. So the Lord Mayor didn't have the courtesy to advise us that this flood review was being handed down, um, despite the fact that my ward was so uh, dramatically flood impacted. Uh, and it's very disappointing, I think, that he, he didn't volunteer to share that. I also note that he tabled the report today but didn't offer us uh, a copy of the report. Um, so I must thank Councillor Griffiths, who did print one for me uh, today. Uh, I want to put on the record um, my thanks to Justice de Jersey for uh, the time he took to complete this review. Uh, I did meet with him and speak to him, and I did put in a substantive um, submission. Um, part of that submission related to backflow valves. And um, I encourage all councillors to read it. You might be surprised about what I said. Backflow valve certainly wasn't the focus uh, of the submission. It was a, a small part. Um, but what I did point out is um, that after the 2011 floods, Council did do an independent review. The independent review recommended we look at backflow valves. Council, uh, Council then did a further review that looked at what that would look like, how feasible they would be. Um, they, the engineers who did that report went out into our community and they spoke to residents. It was, it was back when this council actually used to talk to residents, they went out into suburban areas and they talked to residents. And um, they came away with a really good understanding of what residents expected from um, mitigation. There was a good dialogue and exchange about how backflow valves worked and what they would do. Um, as a result of the AECOM report that came out in 2012, uh, 51 locations around the city were recommended as being feasible for backflow valve uh, devices. Council then went ahead and funded some of those. And it's of great interest to me on page 107 of uh, uh, Mr De Jersey's report that he lists where the backflow valve dimension, uh, devices were actually located. <clears throat> um, he notes in his report at recommendation uh, 3.1, oh, sorry, uh, at <coughs> recommendation 3.1, the following backflow prevention devices. That Council continues to reassess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. Um, he also makes the note that he believes that Council is doing this uh, in the report, and I'll talk a little bit more about his recommendations in the report in just a few minutes. Um, I think he's probably unaware of what happened in this chamber on the 22nd of March. Um, at that time, I moved a, a motion calling on Council to uh, fund all the backflow valve devices recommended in 2011. Um, the LMP refused to support that motion. Um, they changed that motion to say uh, that they did not support, let's be clear, they did not support the installation of backflow valves. Um, they would do a reassessment, but they did not support the installation of backflow valves. Um, I find it really interesting that as part of this 2022 recommendation, Council has done two things. And I am calling, and I note neither the Lord Mayor or the Deputy Mayor is here, um, the Infrastructure Chairman's not here, uh, basically, basically no one in any kind of decision-making mode in this Council could be bothered to turn up to have a debate about flood mitigation in this city. Um, but there are two things that happened. 
Council clearly made a submission to the De Jersey Review, so I'm calling on the Lord Mayor to release the council submission uh, publicly so we know what Council told Justice Paul De Jersey. One of the biggest problems with the review before us today is that he relied on information provided by Council. There's no independent information other than from councillors. Uh, there is no information from residents other than it being provided through councillors. Uh, and there are some really serious problems, I think, in simply accepting the advice that Council has given. Um, he seems to be under the impression that Council is still considering installation of backflow valve devices, and I'll come to this issue in just a moment. Second issue is, uh, according to Justice de Jersey's review, um, there's been some independent assessment by Council of the effectiveness of backflow valves. The second thing I'm calling for today is for the Lord Mayor to release the study that looked at the effectiveness of backflow valves. It is very clear to me that Council has done some work in this space but they're not prepared to tell us the outcome of that or to share that information with us. And I'm calling on Council to release those two documents to the public. My community and I am interested in this. Um, and I think that as a matter of goodwill, Council should be releasing those documents for public consultation. Um, <clears throat> It's very interesting that Council, uh, that the uh, report from uh, Justice de Jersey uh, looks at backflow valves, where they were delivered last time and what would be required to deliver the ones that uh, weren't installed after 2011. Um, and I want to just take a quick look at uh, the Appendix C, which is page 107 of, um, of the flood, 2022 Flood Review. It notes that 15 of the 51 locations were implemented. So in 11 years, Council has failed to look at 36 other locations that were recommended in 2021. Uh, in, sorry, 2011. Uh, only 15 locations have actually been delivered. Let's look at um, when that was. The vast majority of these were delivered between 2011 and 2014. That's a decade ago. The last time a backflow valve was delivered was in 2015-16, and then it um, carried over into 17-18. It's been at least five to six years since Brisbane City Council delivered a backflow valve in Brisbane. So in the last five to six years, zero backflow valves have been delivered in Brisbane. Now, interestingly, we had a debate earlier tonight and Councillor Howard was outraged, outraged, um, that uh, uh, there was some allegation that only $3 million had been spent out of a $10 billion three-year spend by Council uh, on homelessness, and she was rightly outraged. Um, I'm sure she's going to stand up and speak to this item and be outraged about what I'm about to say. In the past five to six years, Council has spent zero dollars on backflow valves. And during that time, $15 billion has been spent by Council in its successive budgets. $15 billion of Council budgets, zero dollars on the delivery of backflow valves. Now that's just a matter of record. Unless someone's going to stand up and say Justice de Jersey's report's wrong, page 107, um, I'd be very interested to, uh, to hear how that's going to be disputed. Um, I am appalled um, that this administration uh, is not delivering on its commitments both in 2011 and in 2022. On the 22nd of March, the motion I moved in this chamber called on Council to deliver all the backflow valves. As part of that debate, some truly terrible things were said by Councillor Adams, who I note is not in the chamber here today. Um, <clears throat> she said, uh, we need to, and I'm quoting her here, we need to say again um, that the event for the backflow valves would have made a difference. Well, tick, we know that they did. The report before us today in 2022 clearly says that where we could look at the evidence from the backflow valves, they helped prevent flooding in certain areas. 
Not only did they help prevent flooding in certain areas, they did not make the flooding worse in those areas, which is also one of the allegations that's often made about backflow valves. So the Deputy Mayor's reasons for not funding backflow valves just a few weeks ago have been disproven by the 2022 flood report. Uh, she went on to say that uh, none of us in this chamber were hydro hydrologic engineers. None of us were hydrologic engineers, which is true. I agree with her. We're not. The hydrolo hydrology engineers, Max Winders and the others that investigated this issue back in 2011 and made these recommendations, they were the experts. They were the experts that made the uh, recommendations that this council and the LNP council have not followed. Now, now the preeminent jurist in this state, a retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Queensland, has stood up and also said backflow prevention devices work. Councillor Johnson, your time has expired. Oh. Oh, Further speakers, Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak in relation to the motion, and I would like to move an amendment. So, I would like to delete the words that say prioritise and fund the backflow prevention devices as recommended, and insert the words notes the Lord Mayor has committed to acting on all recommendations, including. Therefore, the new motion would read that Brisbane City Council notes that the Lord Mayor has committed to acting on all recommendations, including 3.1 of the De Jersey 2022 flood report. Have you got copies of that to circulate? Sure. Uh, yeah, point of order, Mr Chairman. I'd just like to have a look at that, but I certainly am objecting to um, that change. Uh, the purpose of the motion before us today is to fund the delivery of backflow Point of order, valves. Mr Chair, that's not a relevant point. Uh, I, I've, I've just got it myself, Councillor Johnson. Could you sit down for a moment while I just read the amendment, the proposed amendment? And wait for you to get a copy of it as well. Councillor Hutton, to your amendment. Okay, so you're, you're moving. A, your point of order is in relation to the well, amendment. The, the amendment that, uh, sorry, the motion that I moved called on council to fund, to prioritise and fund the backflow devices uh, as recommended in uh, the 2022 flood report. Um, the amendment is saying that the Lord Mayor notes um, that the, the Lord Mayor is not. Uh, uh, referred to in my motion. My motion refers to prioritising and funding that is being removed, and the critical part of my motion before us today is to fund and prioritise the implementation of that recommendation. Noting it is a very different uh, and a substantial change to the original motion that's been put forward. Although, although it is sp specific to acting on all recommendations, including 3.1 of the De Jersey 22 flood review, and I believe that the amendment is consistent with the original motion. And point of, point of order. Point of order. <clears throat> and have you sought legal advice on this issue? I, no, I, I've uh, read. I've just read the uh, recommended, the, read the uh, amendment, and believe it's in accord with the original motion. And Mr. Chairman, I'm encouraging you to seek legal advice on this. Okay. Thank you for your. No I'll note your suggestion. I believe this is consistent with the original motion. All right, then I'll move dissent in your Dissent has been uh, moved your in my decision. ruling. Is it Seconded. Seconded. A dissent in my ruling has been moved by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Griffiths. All in favour of, of that motion, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Aye. No. The Division. noes have it. Division has been called. Seconded.
by Councillor Johnson and by Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. <coughs> Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour and 15 against. Mr Chair, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. The Lord Mayor has committed to enacting the recommendations of the review, and so this motion before us is accurate and in accordance with the current status of the review. Um, Mr De Jersey pulled together a fantastic report, which I know we've received today, um, and as the Lord Mayor committed to the media, as well as in our chamber here, he is happy to enact those 37 recommendations, by which also includes uh, the backflow valves. Thank you. Thank you. It's a second. Oh. Thank you. Further speakers on the amendment? Yeah. Councillor Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, please excuse me. Um, again, we see um, the level of seriousness in which the LNP is treating um, flood recovery in this city. Um, we've got a backbench councillor who's got nothing to do with implementing this <coughs> recommendation, uh, who has been sent out to run interference. Uh, on um, an amendment that actually reflects what is in the report before us today. Uh, so the amendment that's been put forward uh, is suggesting that we note, let me be clear, the language is that we note um, that the Lord Mayor has said he'll implement all of the recommendations. Now, Councillor Hutton is still fairly new in this place. Um, if you pull out the flood report from 2011, you will find it stamped by council saying all of those recommendations were, and I quote, completed. Um, what this council says and what it does are two different things. So the fact that the LNP wants to go from um, prioritising and funding recommendation 3.1 to noting recommendation 3.1 demonstrates that this administration is not serious about delivering on the recommendations in this report. They can't be trusted. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Cummings. They can't be trusted. Um, and it is fascinating again that instead of actually saying yes, when they have the opportunity on the record in this place, when they have the chance to say yes, we will fund the recommendation. We will deliver on his language, and let me, be quote, uh, let me quote his language again, that council continues to assess and prioritise, prioritise is um, Mr De Jersey's language, the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. 
Now, let's take Councillor Hutton's example, because she has been here for a couple of years now. In the past five years, Council has not delivered a single backflow valve in this city. Zero. Zero backflow valves, zero dollars, zero homes protected. In that same time, Council has uh, had $15 billion in its budgets and chosen not to allocate one single cent towards the delivery of backflow uh, <laughs> prevention devices. Um, now, I think when I started this debate, uh, I called for the report to be released. Um, and I'm very much interested in, in what Council said to Mr De Jersey, uh, because if they have been reassuring him that Council is still doing this, it's very clear that they're not. So when Councillor Hutton stands up and doesn't want to prioritise and fund backflow devices, but to note... Point of order, Chair. Claim to be misrepresented. Councillor Hutton does not want to prioritise and fund backflow prevention devices. Let me be clear, I'm going to say it again. Councillor Hutton does not want to prioritise and fund backflow prevention devices. She's moved an amendment... She's moved an amendment, and I, I, I know Councillor Cunningham thinks it's funny, um, and perhaps she'll hop up and contribute. She is the chair responsible for, for natural disasters in this place. Really? I don't think she knows, but she is. It actually sits in her area of responsibility. Do we hear from her about any of this ever? No. So um, the motion before us today that Councillor Hutton's seeking uh, to change removes the words prioritise and fund. And she doesn't want people to know that. She just wants you to know that you're going to note uh, what's going on. So let's, uh, let's, be uh, let's talk about what the Lord Mayor actually thinks noting involves. When he spoke on this matter on the 22nd of March, uh, he said the following. He doesn't want to go blindly and implement the rec recommendations of a report in 2012. Mm -hmm. that, would be a very, very, that would be a very, very poor decision, an incredibly poor decision. So that's just six weeks ago. The Lord Mayor said recommending uh, the uh, recommendations out of, uh, delivering the recommendations out of 2011 would be a very poor decision. Um, this time round, he hasn't stood up and said, yes, we will fund and prioritise the installation of backflow devices. He sent Councillor Hutton out to run interference for him, and they're going to note that he might, deliver on the, uh, he might deliver on the recommendations that are in here. It's our job as councillors to hold this council to account for its decisions and to make sure the funding that is needed to implement these recommendations actually happens. And it is fascinating today that the LNP is choosing to vote against prioritising and funding backflow valve delivery. And we only have to look at their track record to know that they are not doing it, that they stopped doing it five years ago, and over the past five years they've spent not a single cent on delivering backflow uh, devices. Now, um, the other interesting things that are in councillor, uh, um, sorry, in the flood review uh, is the indication uh, from the deputy mayor a few weeks ago as well. Uh, that the backflow valves wouldn't protect any more homes. Now, she went on at length about how it would not be responsible and how I didn't know what I was talking about and there were no homes that would be protected. Um, it's very clear, again, that uh, Paul de Jersey identifies that 250 properties will be protected by the backflow devices. Now, in my area, that includes suburbs such as Fairfield, Yeronga, Yeronpilly, Tennyson, Chelma and Graceville. And there are a lot of other suburbs outside of my area uh, in other councillors' wards that would be protected by these. The Lord Mayor uh, says that uh, to go blindly into this uh, would be a mistake. It would be a poor decision. Um, it's very clear that Council does have costings for these backflow devices. They identified that they'd cost approximately $21 million. We don't have a breakdown of which ones would cost what, and I'll be certainly seeking that information. 
Uh, it's very clear that Council's got a lot more uh, info on the record here about backflow devices than they've ever told us before. So it is very, very clear that this Council could spend um, 20 plus million dollars and put in backflow devices. $15 billion over the last five years and zero spent on backflow devices. In the last year, Council has spent $3 million promoting the Brisbane app. It's in the um, responses to questions on notice today. So um, when Councillor Hutton stands up and says, no, we don't want to prioritise and fund backflow devices, but she's happy to spend $3 million on advertising an app, but not installing flood mitigation in my ward. Now, there are none recommended in her area. Uh, there are none recommended. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it, that this council's happy to spend $3 million on advertising but won't spend a single cent investing in backflow uh, prevention devices. Uh, so I don't support this amendment. I think that the LNP is showing its true colours tonight, that it only wants to note the decisions of flood recovery and the flood recommendations. It doesn't want to act on them. Um, a person who wants to act on them says yes. I'll look at it. I'll put it in the budget. I'll be looking at funding for backflow devices. We'll get them back on the agenda. I know we haven't spent any money on them in the last five years. I'm going to prioritise them as uh, Paul de Jersey recommends. That's not what the LNP want to do. They want to, uh, they want to note the outcomes of uh, the flood review. Uh, they don't want to act on them and they don't want to fund them. Councillor Hutton's made that very clear today. I think that's very disappointing and I urge all councillors to uh, vote against the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Hutton, your claim of misrepresentation. Uh, yes, Mr Chair. I did not suggest that we did not want to fund backflow valves. valves. I simply said that we would accept the 37 recommendations yeah. that Mr De Jersey has provided to us today. Thank you, Councillor Hutton. Further speakers on the amendment? Any further speakers on the amendment? Now we'll put the uh, amendment to the vote. All in favour of accepting the amendment as moved, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Division. Johnson and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 15 in favour and five against. Thank you. Councillors, please return to your seats as quickly as possible. The debate is now on the substantive motion. Um, that is, that Brisbane City Council notes the Lord Mayor has committed to acting on all recommendations, including 3.1 of the De Jersey 2022 flood review. Are there any speakers? <laughs> Councillor Maddock. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I rise to speak in support of this motion, um, which I th and I think, and to clarify some points that were made by Councillor Johnson on this issue. Um, firstly, Mr Chairman, um, I want to acknowledge the work uh, of uh, the Honourable uh, Justice de Jersey uh, in regards to this recommendation um, and the, the succinct nature in which the recommendations are set forward on page 87. And I'm sure and I note that Councillor Johnson has read through as quickly as she can through this document since its release uh, earlier today. And undoubtedly she would have had the opportunity to read through these recommendations on page 87 
uh, in, and particularly in regards to her motion, which is 3.1, which is the backflow, backflow prevention devices, and it says that council continues to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy, which is in complete alignment with the motion as amended uh, that says that the Brisbane City Council notes the Lord Mayor has committed to acting on all recommendations, including 3.1 of the New Jersey Flood Review. So the Lord Mayor is actually continuing to implement these recommendations uh, in total, which includes backflow devices. Now, Mr Chairman, we had a debate in this chamber previously uh, in regards to backflow devices and their, their implementation, their history and their effectiveness. And I thought we had a very sensible debate in that regards um, talking about the history of it. Councillor Johnston noted that there are actually backflow devices within her own ward. We also noted that there were um, certain devices that were in the initial uh, report in her ward which were uh, assessed and prioritised in accordance with those guidelines back then, which in this report, Justice de Jersey actually notes the previous backflow uh, prevention devices, actually at page 55. And he notes the history of it, and he also continues to note um, that all of the devices were based on a priority. And it simply says um, within the report that, um, and he reiterates that very same process of prioritisation uh, citywide uh, on the benefit of number of homes, habitable floor, all of, the, all of the criteria that the office has implemented. He notes that and in his recommendation reiterates the previous approach. So everything has been done in accordance with the existing process and everything that the Lord Mayor intends to do in, in implementing all of these recommendations in accordance with that process. So when you hear Councillor Johnston speak on this issue now, um, you would think that nothing has been done. You would think that somehow um, there is no investment in, in backflow devices. And importantly also, in the previous motion that was put forward, this chamber agreed uh, and supported the refresh of that review of those previous backflow devices. So not only previously did the Lord Mayor agree to continue to review and refresh all of the previous investigations, but now we have Justice de Jersey's recommendations, which the Lord Mayor is fully implementing. All of these measures show that this administration, this Lord Mayor, is actually fully committed to backflow devices in this city, where required and for the most benefit to those communities that need them. There's no question here, Mr Chairman, of any doubt or any uh, reversal of that process whatsoever. Unfortunately, we have a position from Councillor Johnston that is completely out of step with everything that we debated in the chamber previously, everything that's in this report, and the fact that the Lord Mayor is actually going to uh, uh, roll out the, and accept all of these recommendations. What we need, Mr Chairman, from Councillor Johnston is, is a reflection of what reality is. From Councillor Johnston, an acknowledgement of the fact that these backflow devices have to be assessed by certain criteria, but we're not going to get that. Uh, we've never got it in the past since the 2011 flood event, since the recommendations that were brought down in regards to the backflow devices after that, and hence. But Mr Chairman, the reality of the situation is, the, is that this administration is committed to that. One of the important conversations that we had in regards to backflow devices at the previous motion debate, which I think is absolutely integral in this process, is the complete effectiveness of, uh, of, of what a backflow device means and how effective it is in its installation and, and to its local community. There were many points raised by Councillor Shree previously as to the necessity of having them so that we can reduce the impact on um, our infrastructure, on our roads, on our footpaths, on parks and all of the council's infrastructure, and that somehow these would be Im uh, impacted less by a backflow device. Well, Mr Chairman, I have to tell you that within the impacted areas of my board, there are a number of parks that are affected, roads that require re resurfacing, footpaths that uh, need to be redone, um, softball that needs to be replaced, like every other council in this ward, and uh, we spoke about this in the infrastructure uh, uh, flood uh, um, presentation uh, this morning. All of these need replacing and have been severely impacted by the 2022 flood. And guess what, Mr Chairman? Uh, we've got backflow devices in the ward, and they were on, and they worked efficiently, but it did not mitigate or, uh, but it did not reduce the impact of flooding 
on that infrastructure. And that is a key point that needs to be reiterated in this whole conversation about backflow devices. They are not a panacea to, to flooding. That our infrastructure and our local communities in significant events like we've just seen will continue to flood and the backflow device will continue to work effectively. Why? Because it keeps the river out, but it does not stop the overland flow. It does not stop the damage from the rain. So that's why an assessment criteria is needed in regards to backflow devices and what maximum benefit can be provided from them. But ultimately, Mr Chairman, wherever they're installed across our ward, the end result is that depending on the flooding event, we will still flood. There will still be impacts to our local communities. Residents' homes will be severely impacted. Council's infrastructure will be severely impacted and we will have to go through the process again of rebuilding and doing the things we need to do to mitigate because ultimately this is what these recommendations are about, mitigation. And that's why this Lord Mayor is making sure that he's committed to implementing all of these recommendations to mitigate for future events and to incorporate backflow devices into all of that thinking moving forwards. But we shouldn't focus on Councillor Johnston's comments, which unfortunately are not correct in what she's saying. And we should instead focus on the reality of what we face and the challenges that we need to address. And this report goes a long way to doing that. And importantly, the Lord Mayor's commitment to it ensures that when we have, when we have an event in the future, we will be better prepared for it. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers on the substantive motion? Councillor Johnston. I thank Councillor Maddock for uh, contributing to the debate today. Um, he does have a horse in this race, um, and I note that his ward has received multiple backflow valves, um, which the report found were useful in helping to mitigate uh, the impacts of flooding. Um, very clearly, that's what's said in this report before us today. It's just a shame that he feels that other wards don't deserve to have the backflow valves recommended in their areas funded again. Because the motion that the LNP changed before us today was to remove support Point of order, for Mr. funding. Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Maddock. Claim to be misrepresented. No. So, Councillor Maddock and all the LNP councillors today voted against funding backflow valve devices. Yes. That's what they did. Um, and as much as they hop up and say, oh, you're misrepresenting me, they got Councillor Hutton to read out an amendment written by the Lord Mayor's staff, most likely, to say we are going to take out prioritising and funding backflow valves. That's what they all just voted to stop. Claim to be misrepresented. Oh, excuse Chair. me, Councillor Sorry, Hutton. Point of, order. point of order. Point of order. Claim to be misrepresented. Point of order to you, Councillor Hutton. She Noted. moved a motion removing the words prioritise and fund. I'm not sure how she can be misrepresented. It was her decision to stand up and do it. No doubt that they went round, I remember what it was like, they would have gone round the room and said, who wants to have a go at Councillor Johnston today? Who wants to do it? And the hands would have gone up. It's your turn, Councillor Hutton. Here's the amendment. Um, and the amendment says that we're going to delete the words prioritise and fund. Um, and, you know, the fact that she wants to deny it now is quite interesting, but I'm getting off the track. Um, it was a bit hard to tell if Councillor Maddock was supportive of uh, the motion that's been moved here today or not. I want to say a few things. He said that I was not correct in the comments that I had made today about what was happening with backflow valves. Again, I want to tell everybody listening and everybody who may read this that on page 107 of the report that Justice De Jersey handed down today, he has provided a list of where the backflow valves that have been delivered were located, the years in which they were funded and how much they cost. That document, page 107, Appendix C, clearly shows that in the last five years, where Council has had a budget of over $15 billion for the city, zero, zero has been spent on backflow valves. Zero has been spent. Now, the LNP would want to have you believe that they are committed to delivering backflow valves. Um, Councillor Maddox says that, oh, uh, the Lord Mayor intends to do, um, note the comments that are in here, 
Um, the Lord Mayor intends to deliver the backflow vows. For the past five years, this administration has done nothing. And before that, there was only one between 2014 and 2018, and that ran across two years. So over the past eight years, this council has pretty much delivered one backflow valve in Bulimba. That's not what I say uh, through you, Mr Chairman, to Councillor Maddock. So when Councillor Maddock stands up and says Councillor Johnston is not correct in what she's saying, I am quoting, I'm quoting uh, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Paul de Jersey. That's what he says. Now, uh, again, um, we, heard, we actually heard Councillor Maddox say this several times, that uh, he reiterates that they want to prioritise the backflow valves. Again, they've just moved an amendment to the motion that did say we would prioritise and fund backflow valves, and they've said that they're not going to do that. They are going to note the recommendations in the report. They are two different things. What this tells us is, one, their track record is that they have failed to deliver backflow vices over the past five years. Not a single dollar, not a single backflow uh, valve device. And for the past decade, every year, I've moved a motion calling on them to be funded. Um, we've heard um, that the uh, recommendation, uh, sorry, that the amendment they've moved is in complete alignment with the uh, uh, recommendation here with uh, Paul de Jersey's uh, 3.1 uh, recommendation. That calls on these devices to be prioritised. Um, that is what the LNP do not want to do. They don't want to prioritise them and they don't want to fund them. And Councillor Hutton's going to stand up in a minute and say, no, no, she didn't say we don't want to prioritise and fund them. That's the motion that she just moved. Um, but thank goodness the Lord Mayor is going to note the fact that uh, we're going to have these backflow devices. Um, I'll be reminding him on a regular basis that he's noted um, this review. I'll be reminding him on a regular basis that over the past five years he's spent zero dollars, zero dollars on delivering backflow um, devices. This year there'll be another three plus billion dollars go into the council budget, and I'll be interested to see how much funding goes into uh, delivering on the backflow. Uh, devices, uh, because certainly there's been none over the past five years. I will keep reminding the LNP that they spend three million dollars on advertising an app, but there is zero dollars for backflow devices. And when I tell people this in my community, they are shocked. They are shocked. And when I tell them we spend about thirty million dollars a year out of a three billion dollar budget on stormwater drainage generally, that shocks them even more. But let's be clear, the outcome of the motion here today is the LNP say uh, that they are noting, noting uh, the uh, recommendation by Paul de Jersey, which calls on the backflow um, devices to be assessed and prioritised. They don't want to prioritise and fund them, they just want to note that there is a recommendation that says they should be prioritised. Um, if there is anything that says more than the fact that the motion before us today uh, on flood recovery uh, is that this administration wants to note something, not act on it, not deliver on it, not fund it, not make life better for residents in my ward that were flooded and in other wards around the city. It's not just my ward. This LNP administration just wants to note it. And they want to note, um, they want to note that they intend to do something about it. Um, but you've got, you can't trust them because their track record says that they won't do anything about it. Because for the past five years, they haven't done anything about it. And despite $15 billion in budgets over the past five years, zero dollars have been spent on backflow devices. Does anybody think that they're going to make an effort in this budget? I'll fall over backwards. I'll, I'll, I'll fall over backwards if the Lord Mayor suddenly decides to fund backflow valves in this budget. I, I mean, he's not here, and neither is Councillor Adams. The, the chair in charge of uh, natural disasters in this place couldn't be bothered to comment. Um, but it's OK, because they've noted the recommendation, and they intend to do something about it, uh, but they haven't really done anything about it for the past five years. I mean, how proud? How proud you should be of yourselves. I mean, good on you.
Councillor Maddox, point, your point of misrepresentation. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Councillor Johnson said that I felt that some wards should receive backflow devices uh, and some less worthy. Uh, that's untrue. What I said was that, um, that the officers assess uh, all uh, locations on a, on a priority basis for the most benefit of that local community, irrespective of which ward they're in. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor. Claim to be misrepresented. Okay, noted. Councillor Hutton, your point of misrepresentation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnson suggested that I did not want to fund backflow val valves. Quite the opposite. We are, we are committed to funding the 37 recommendations here in the report. And I think it's very clear that the LNP team are committed to in, in enacting the recommendation and the review that we've had here before us. Thank you, Councillor Hutton. Councillor Johnson, your point of misrepresentation. Uh, Councillor Maddock just stood up and said that I said uh, that not all backflow valves should be delivered. Uh, I made no such statement whatsoever. <laughs> Time to be misrepresented. <laughs> One point of order at a time, please, he Councillor Maddock. completely made up um, any such reference. I've called on mine and all of them to be funded, and any such aspersion that I've said anything else is completely untrue. Thank you. Councillor Maddock, you have a Thanks, point. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Why not? We're here for a while. Um, Mr Chairman, Councillor Johnson said earlier that I said that... that, um, that, that <laughs> That's right. She said that I said that I said that um, I felt that some uh, wards should uh, receive backflow de devices over others and that some wards are less worthy of receiving, and you did. And I did not say that. I said that all officers, that the officers assess these backflow devices across the whole city on a priority basis. Thank you, Councillor Maddox. We'll leave, we'll leave this particular item alone, please. Are, are there any further speakers? Are there any further speakers on the substantive motion? No further speakers on the substantive motion. We'll now put that motion for the vote. Uh, the motion is that Brisbane City Council notes the Lord Mayor has committed to acting on all recommendations, including 3.1 of the De Jersey 2022 Flood Review. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Hutton and I didn't see a second to Councillor Adams. Ayes to the right, noes to the left, please ring the bell. In silence, please. Okay. Thank you, Billy. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 15 in favour and five abstentions. Thank you. I declare that motion carried and I declare the meeting closed.